knight at five is probably good. Ooh, knight at five, I just, I accidentally stumbled into attack. I thought I was forcing him to take on f3, but actually if you take on e4, I have knight g3, exploding the, the pit, pinned f pawn on f2, because the queen is hanging. The rook can't take on g3, because the rook, queen on f1 is hanging a different way. So that was an accidental nice tactic that I find. find me. Very accidental, I just actually- Accidental brilliance, but we just know that Robert is actually alpha zero in person. No, I'm just zero, like in the movie <laughs>
the Sopranos have an all-time showing today and win this Battle Royale, they will be able to take that final playoff spot away from one of those two teams. It will be very exciting to see if they're able to do that today. I'm also excited to see it. We, at the same time, have witnessed that the field is similar to previous Battle Royales and previous matches, but I was surprised personally to see some of the names that are maybe playing from a location that's a bit first of all very late i'm talking about kazakhstan where the world team championship is being held and some of the players that usually participate in the pro chess league are competing in the world team championship the past week and this week so to see gadir gusainov for instance in the field for today was a big surprise to me i don't know what your thought is on that robert no, definitely. Seeing players like Gusenov play from Kazakhstan where they're competing in the World Team Chess Championship is definitely shocking. And we saw a tremendous error on behalf of the St. Louis Archbishops last week when Alejandro Ramirez, who was completely winning in his final game of their matchup with Miami Champions, his internet crashed. He lost that game because of that. And then the Archbishops lost the match 9-7 to to the Miami Champions. So if you're playing from Kazakhstan, from Astana there, I hope you have good internet connection. A probably Ethernet cord will be of good use, and that way you don't have to worry about things like forfeiting due to disconnection. Indeed, and we have the captain of the Armeni Armenia Eagles, Artak Manukian, in the chat. Shout out to the defending champions. He's saying that our Zavin, and he's referring to, of course, their board one, Zavin Andresian, He's going to play from Astana as well, and that's going to be on Thursday. So, so many dedicated players. They don't mind that it's it's going to be like half past two in the morning for Gusaino when his games begin, and he will have to be playing until half past five in the morning. Yeah, and for Zavon Andreasen, he is the coach of the Armenian women's team, so he doesn't actually have to play in the games. That doesn't mean his job is easy, of course. Coaching any oh, team is very maybe difficult. more difficult than being a player. <laughs> um, not, I might not go that far. The stress levels, <laughs> actually, it's pretty tough. I can't deny it. And, well, as soon as we talk about stress levels, of course, an ambulance is coming my way here. There we go. Let's get New some York of City. those emotes in the chat to start the day there with. There it is. I see the it. The ambulance. An Shout out to the ambulance. Of course. And the ambulance. And saving lives. The ambulance is always Before going them. there. They're always, they're always running by here, but... Um, let's see if so, on, on the flip side, right? There are some players playing from Kazakhstan, but there are certainly players who are not. For example, mm -hmm. Sam Sevian for the Montclair Sopranos, Alexander yeah. Lenderman for the Montclair Sopranos. Um, mm -hmm. Who else is there? I mean, there's so many players. I mean, Alejandro Ramirez not playing this week because he's out there in Astana. Yeah. So many players from different teams, uh, you will not see them play this week because of their participation in the World Team Chess Championship. Indeed, the Sopranos, as you highlighted, they are the biggest team that is missing out on their top players. Their top three boards are competing in the World Team Championship, and that's why they have a different lineup for this week and last week. The Chess Bras were the team to, to actually take advantage of this, and we discussed with Amon Hambaton when he joined us at the end of the show whether this was an arrangement between FIDE and the Chess Bras that the dates would coincide. <laughs> Definitely, you know, collusion, of course. The, the chess bras, um, you know, will struggle perhaps, but no, okay. The chess bras right now, they're in good shape, thanks to the likes of Ivan Saric. So I think if you're a fan of the chess bras, you should be happy that Croatia is not in the World Team Chess Championship. Otherwise, your board one would not be making his appearance in this very critical final battle royale of the Pro Chess League season. Indeed. Also, shout out to international master Eric Rosen. I see that unity emote in the chat and we are about to start the games this is the first battle royale as we highlighted but the last week the last regular season so today half of the teams will disappear forever from planet earth well, maybe not drastic, <laughs> but half of the teams will say goodbye to the 2019 process league season and some of the teams will even need to make their way their way back the bottom two teams in every division will need to try to qualify again in a qualification tournament. They will be relegated. Yes, exactly. I saw some people asking that very question. I see in the chess.com TV chat, uh, Chess Freak 2020, Wind, uh, Magnus 51 Carlson, and of course, Blue Wizard, that is Dennis Boros, who is saying, ole, ole, windmills, win all, ole. Mm -hmm. So we clearly have a grandmaster, but simultaneously a cheerleader this week for the Webster Windmills. He does play for them throughout the season. 
Grandmaster slash cheerleader. I like it. <laughs> so how do I pronounce Yvonne's last name? Because I see all Sharich. of it. Say it again. Sharich. Sharich. So the, the first letter has a thingy on the top. So that's not an S, but it's it's like Shein sheep, I would say. Okay. That's my, I mean, as far as I understand Croatian pronunciation. And the end is like ch and chicken. Okay. So Sharich. Sharich. Sorry. Thank you, actually, for that correction. I don't mind when anyone corrects me. In fact, I would prefer that you do. So thank you, Oliver112468, for the proper pronunciation and calling my attention to it, because I always try my best to uh, pronounce names correctly. I just don't know without having heard them myself. <laughs> we also welcome the New York Marshals in the chat. They're going to be fighting today in the Atlantic Division for the top spots. And it's important, even if the teams, for instance, the St. Louis Archbishops and the New York Marshals, you may say, what's at stake for them? They are almost sure to be in the playoffs. But there's a lot at stake because the better place the team is, the better it is for the playoffs. In the playoff system, it's going to be a knockout system. And in case of an 8-8, the team that finished ahead of the other team in the regular season will move on in case of a tie. So there's a lot at stake even for the top teams. So go marshals, go archbishops, and the windmill soprano chess brass, those three teams will fight it out for two spots. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, well, well, it remains to be seen what will happen in this one, but we have, the action is yet to get underway. Hopefully it gets underway soon for everybody watching, but. Um, it's going to be for sure an interesting day. And in teams at the bottom, like the London Lions, they will play a huge part in who makes the playoffs here because let's say the, Lion, the Lions beat the Chess Bros head to head but get demolished 4 0 by the Sopranos. These kind of things will happen and will shake up the standings for sure. Indeed. Uh, I, I'm actually very curious to see where will be a bigger fight in terms of uh, just a half a point or one point difference will decide. Will it be for the playoff spots or will it be for the relegation places? What do you think, Robert? Where will we see at the end of the standings something really close in terms of a half a point or one point deciding whether a team is out or whether a team makes it to the playoff? Well, of course, down at the bottom of the standings, it's closer there with the champions and the pawn grabber. So I think that will inevitably be the closer matchup, but only time will tell, right? We can't be certain about this. And, well, hopefully it's you know, a good fighting match throughout yeah, the And just a reminder for everyone that in the Battle Royale, there's a lot of points at stake. So not like a regular match, there's 24 points for the team that wins, 20 points for second place, 16 points for third, and so on and so on, plus the game points. So any team can actually still cause a surprise. Yes, absolutely. And... All right, so has the action begun yet? Let me take a peek. No, we so are about to start. Let us know in the chat who are you rooting for, which team are you rooting for, unless it's super obvious, like in the case of Armenia Eagles and New York Marshals. Yeah, they, they make it pretty obvious. They're not really holding anything back there. <laughs> Although maybe you want to tell us to. <laughs> no, don't tell us anything. We'll, we'll guess. We'll be fine guessing. So let's... Uh, <laughs> let's... Yeah, let's let's just wait. I see, see. Shadok is only supporting the New York Marshals because of Levy. Levy Roseman, shout out to Gotham Chess. He's gonna be streaming the match of the New York Marshals, of course, as usual. Eric Rosen supporting the Windmills. Go Tom Pogar. <laughs> George Bloomer team <laughs> says Terminoid. Awesome. So you have your favorite player too. And the first games have just begun. Okay. The one I'm witnessing at the moment is is a big one it's one of the biggest clashes of the day it's ivan sharic with the white pieces against pavel ayano with the rating average of almost 2700 the two together yeah casual matchup at the top and of course Eliano knowing better <laughs> than to play a french so he plays the improved french with the caracom i'm sorry anna you know i had to get in a a joke at the french's expense already don't cry please i'm sorry the pug on the wall try to forgive me as well but um this caracom We'll be, <laughs> we'll be played very quickly here by both sides because we're still in mainline theory. Um, Sharich, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to pronounce that correctly as the day continues. That was, I think, a, re a really good one. I would Thank say you. perfect pronunciation. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm trying my best here. Uh, but Sharich, with the white pieces, is taking up more space. Right, The 95 is the most advanced piece. None of Black's pieces are past the, its own third rank, his own third rank, I should say, with the C mm -hmm. and E6 pawn. So white has more space, but Black has a very solid foundation, right? Not easy to start attacking squares, black and castle queenside, and try to claim that 
all right, I know I don't have space, but I'm so solid that you can't really take advantage of it. Indeed, and both players are playing extremely quick. Well, Shari started thinking a little bit. The time control for the Battle Royale is somewhat shorter than for the regular matches, so it's 10 minutes plus 2 second increment per move. Yeah, yeah, so they get 2 seconds for every move, which is why Eliana just had more than 10 minutes, though you start with 10, 10 minutes for the game, but he knows these openings so well that he was playing instantly. But now all of a sudden, after Queen E2, he starts sitting and thinking, which is a good time to do so, because uh, the, what does this Queen E2 move really do? I'm not totally sure. Perhaps it's going to flip the Queen over to G4, or try to get Knight H5 in, and claim that, again, White has more space and nothing, no weaknesses of his own either. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, for now I would definitely prefer white because of the more space and very comfortable piece placement. But we are just at the beginning of the game. Maybe we could have a little tour around the top board players. As you know, in the Battle Royale, board ones only play against board ones, board twos only against board twos, and so on and so on. Yes, exactly. So this, unlike the typical um, regular season where you play everyone from the other team, here you're only playing your board, but seven rounds of intense action, right? You're not just... Um, sitting here for four games, you get seven games, quicker time control at 10 minutes instead of 15, but the action is going to heat up for sure. So I'm just going to check on the chat to see what's going on. And I just see some familiar faces. We see I am Hans Niemann here, so rooting for the Archbishops. We have Cash Menke giving some bits earlier, and I am Rosen saying, excuse Robert's French. That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> but okay, Do, are there any other games to hop on over to? Uh, Eric Hansen is back after his round robin tournament in St. Louis, where he scored 50% and he's happy with his play. So he's he's motivated. He's here to fight again for his team, the Chess Bras, the main Chess Bra, taking on Eduardo Iturizaga, who is one of the top players from Latin America. He's a very strong grandmaster, especially in, in rapid time controls. So Iturizaga with the white pieces against Eric. I like a lot White's position, health, very healthy pawn chain. And those doubled pawns on the C file, well, it has just fallen. One of them has just fallen. <laughs> yeah, you're about to say there's some very weak double isolated pawns. And the A pawn is also isolated, but down goes C6. And that's why I move eight, uh, 19, excuse me. White was willing to give up this bishop. You tend not to want to give up your Fianchetto bishop. But here, taking on C6, say, well, my king side actually is going to be pretty safe. And I'm going to take this pawn to C6. Now, C7 is hanging. A5 is weak. The bishop on B2 is staring at this pawn at E5, which is great. And the bishop on H3. If you could go jump your queen from e7 to g2 checkmate, you're happy, but their queen has no way to get in. It's going to try to come through g5 into e3, but that in and of itself is a long story because queen takes c7, offers a queen trade, and attacks his knight on b6 as well. So things here look very nice for Iturizaga as long as he can make sure that his king finds good defense. And queen c5 is a nice move as you offer that queen trade once again. If queen to g5, you play knight to e4, attacking this queen, covering the e3 square. So it looks to me on a, like white is just well ahead in a position like this. Yes, I think Eric is in trouble. Unfortunately for all of you who are Chesbra, Chesbra fans, this is not the best start, but anything can happen in short time controls, of course. So far, Iturisaga is a pawn up and has the advantage in that game. Another board one clash I was going to highlight is the one between Fabiano Caruana and Ray Robson two of the best players from the United States, drops on with the white pieces. Yep. What do you think of this middle game? Well, uh, I sort of like Black's position right now. And the reason why I say that, Queen A5 is a nice move. That's exactly what I was mm -hmm. going to say. The A2 pawn is in big trouble. And if you play a move like pawn to A3, then you better watch out for sacrifices on the C3 square. It's a very thematic sacrifice. So A3, rook takes C3, pawn C3, queen takes A3, and, well, the A2 square is still not exactly friendly for white. Black is about to infiltrate there. So I don't know what Ray Roth is going to do here. Knight d5 simply loses a pawn at this point in the game. And mm -hmm. what else can you... I mean, Anna, do you see any other moves? No. <laughs> it may be the case that white is already in some kind of a trouble. I see Hans Niemann in the chat at this game too. He's saying, Fabi's got this. Fabi's got this. Um, I think it's always a safe bet to choose Fabi in, well, pretty much any single game that he plays, with the exception, okay, obviously some other super jams will give him a run for his money if Hikaru Nakamura, Magnus Carlsen, etc. But 
you know, with the exception of maybe 10 to 15 people on the planet, I feel very confident in Fabi's chances in every single game. Uh, though we did see him lose last week to Pavel Elyanov. He actually got crushed by Elyanov. Yeah. So I shouldn't be so strong, so bullish on Karwan's chances. Though here, Anna, I mean, I just really can't find a move for White. I also think that White's position is super unpleasant. And I don't know what he's going to come up with. As you, ha as you have already said, A3, the logical move runs into problems because of the sacrifices right thank you so much faces for the multiple gift subs thank you so much for your support as usual yeah oh he plays g5 counter attacking on the king side but will it be in time if b4 takes takes Ooh. so yeah like you said b4 is an option to hit this knight and go for a2 and there's b4 anna i mean he just not worried about anything because gf6 bc3 well, you can't take my bishop on e7 because queen takes a2 and then queen takes b2 is checkmate so so now he goes for 95 but that means that black can take twice and the a2 pawn is under attack so it's going to be a pawn up for black plus the attack continues i think robson got into trouble already after the opening and i might even take with the bishop on d5 sometimes you can play bishop takes d5 and try to put your knight on c3 a sacrifice in that square but yeah. if i'm being realistic just the simple knight takes d5 go up a pawn here as we've been discussing knight d5 pawn takes bishop d5 you have to go b3 and then i don't know move like queen c5 oh actually hang my a pawn there so not queen c5 but some sort of move oh queen side maybe is possible because f3 will also be hanging in many variations so it's uh looking very good here for Fabiano Caruana with the black pieces, but it's a good moment for him to take a few seconds to figure out, do I take on, and there he just goes, knight takes d5, and he says, I don't want the tactics, I want the free material. Anna, that's a player of your own heart I couldn't there. agree more, I couldn't agree more, I'm gonna use some of my free stuff emotes in the chat, because this is free stuff, and grabbing a pawn is always great, always great. Have I sent it? I thought I clicked on it in the chat. Free stuff. This is free stuff. And Fabiano Caruana is on his way to win this first game of the day. He's even offering a trade of queens because, of course, an end game would be simply quite quite a pleasant advantage. Yeah, and with this pawn on f3 so weak that any time the queen gets traded off, you have to really go ahead and, and protect that square. But it's definitely not game over, right? Black is not castled yet and will have some difficulty castling. It looks like, you know, bishop takes a6 is a free pawn, but as we mentioned, the f3 pawn, that's what this, both sides have batteries, one aiming at the a6 square, the other aiming at f3, and so you can play a move like rook d to f1 here, and say, okay, I have to rook d to f1, I might put my rook on g1 at some moment, I'm hitting a6, clear counter chances for white, but if Fabiano is careful, he should come out on top in this game, and he's also up two and a half minutes on the clock. Yeah, I'm going to have a look at some of the other boards, if there's any interesting position we are missing on. We started our analysis with the Sharic versus Elyanov game, and we, we could go back there for a moment just to see how it has progressed. Whoa, okay, so black is up a pawn and just better? I mean, I see no... Yes. <laughs> well, let's go a few moves back to see where that pawn I don't went. know how that happened after the oh, opening. Oh, look at move 18. White went h5. And bishop takes d4 is simply a free pawn. So, a uh, huge, huge oversight by Sarge there. And now he's simply down a pawn in an endgame. And he definitely has chances to hold this because it's a four on three on the king side. But this pawn on g7, I was about to highlight that, is stuck in its tracks, right? The queen on g4 is coming right after this pawn on g7. So that gives white certain counterplay. And when you play f5, now your e6 pawn is feeling a little bit more vulnerable as well. So uh, I think that Sharic can fight back, claw back in this game, but of course, it's Elianov's game for the taking. Yeah, he has been the MVP for the Chess Bras and also among the rest of the field in the Protoss League, Sharic is the one who has performed one of the highest uh, performances in the Protoss League, performed one of the highest form performances, doesn't make much sense, but yeah, he has collected a lot of points for his team, but this one, he's, he is in trouble. He will have to try to bail out somehow. Absolutely. Um, so he is, you know, a technical task ahead for Elyanov. So I'm trying to look around the games here. So many going on at once. The game between Ilya Nizhnik and uh, Jamil Jean Ali Mirandi, so commonly known as JJ. Nizhnik is up a piece, and both sides' king is weak, but it looks like Nizhnik is first to land the knockout blow because rook g8 check is a brutal threat. So, for example, if black makes some move like rook to d6, rook g8 check, rook takes, 
pawn takes, king takes, and queen h7 check, then forcing the queens off the board with queen h8. And that, in fact, the resignation occurred before any of that could happen because of lines like I was just highlighting. So uh, game over in favor of the windmills and the archbishops off to a bit of a rough start with that loss between two strong grandmasters here. Yeah, where shall we move after these games? Do you want to have a look at some of the board twos as well? There will be so many exciting games to look at. So if we don't mention some of your favorite players, apologies. But you can follow the games you want if you type in live chess, uh, slash follow, and then hashtag PCL. Yes. And I don't even know which game to go to. So I'm going to go to the game between Gadir Gusainov and uh, Vo Wojciech. Is that your friend's name? Wojciech Miranda? Wojciech, I think. Wojciech? Okay. Well, I'm going to trust you think, because... Well, uh, that was my guess of pronunciation in terms of Polish language. Yeah. Apologies, Polish viewers. Yeah, help us out. Please help me. Like I said, I'm, I don't like to be wrong in the sense that I would like to correct my pronunciation, but I don't mind being wrong if, as long as you correct me and make sure that I can fix my mistake. So Miranda here with the white pieces now a7 and a5, so a5 was scooped off first. And that king, on the g8 king, was a pawn missing from the g6 square. So this Fianchetto queen over here is really defending the black king side. But if some rooks start showing up on the fourth rank, swinging over to h4 and g4, then the king will feel mighty unsafe. Yeah, I was just uh, fixing one thing in my setup. I think I'm good now. So I will focus on the chess action from now on and keep up with you, Robert. Okay. Um, so, by the way, it looks like there was a forfeit in the match. Uh, it looks like Tom Bartell forfeited his game. I'm not positive. I want a confirmation on that, but it looks like he did not. Oh. He's not there. So that's never a good sign when a player forfeits a match, but uh, we'll see. Certainly not a good sign. So, okay, this game looks very double-edged here. The c4 pawn weak, the a7 pawn we talked about can be scooped off soon. So we can probably come back here just to focus on, I don't know if there are any other games that are heating up anymore, but, or we can stay here. I'm up, open to your suggestions, Anna. Yeah, I'll have a quick tour around the other boards and see which one oh, is Oh, the, the more... Fabiano game. We definitely have to go there. Okay, let's go back to Fabiano. I think that the audience would agree with that decision. What is going on here? No longer is Fabiano up a pawn, and his his pawns look terrible. Isolated d6, isolated f6, isolated h6, pawn hanging on b4, rook d1 to e1, pins this bishop on e7. Ah, oh, this looks really bad. I feel like from the position where we left Fabiano's game and this one that we are currently looking at, Our... it's like it's if a beginner player would have taken the seat of Fabiano for the last five to seven moves, and that's how we ended up here, like, how on earth is this possible? He's the world number two. Well, he left his king in the center, right? So he went rook to a8. <laughs> I guess he could have taken on g5 and tried to go for this pawn. Instead, he went rook to a8, and after f4, went e4, and simply rook f to e1 with a pin on this pawn on e4. And so out of desperation, plays f5 en passant. G takes f6 back. Just goes to show your position is terrible if you take back with the pawn. And now they're in this end game here where, well, if Ray Robinson doesn't get himself into too much time travel, he should be much better, but not winning. Much, much better for sure. Not a one position by any means. So we'll see how this game will continue to heat up. And I don't know. I mean, uh, Rook to E1 is tempting. Bishop to E1 is tempting. So putting something I wonder how this happened. I'm scrolling back a little because we left it at a position where black is a pawn up and he has zero problems. But then somehow, yeah, um, I don't know. After f4, e4, rook e1, is that the position that he missed? Yeah. Well, we, unfortunately, we don't have time to go for deep analysis in any of the games, but it's certainly shocking that Fabiano from a pawn up ended up being worse. Yeah, and Blue Wizard in the chess.com TV chat is rooting hard for Ray Robson here, his teammate. And I don't like this move rook to d3 because now black should play d5. And I actually think that was a big mistake by Robson because d5 means that you can't take this pawn on d5 with your rook because you need the rook on d3 to cover the bishop on g3. So d5 is a very useful... There it is, d5, opening up the bishop's protection on the pawn on b4, yep. kicking this rook away from the e4 square and allowing black to maybe make a move like king to f7 next. So just to get out of harm's way. And yes, if that's a rook e4 to e3, 
king to f7, rook takes d5, white has won a pawn. But after rook a to d8, your pawns on the queen side are stuck by this one pawn on b4. White's kingside pawns are very weak as well. So it looks like black has the worst behind him all of a sudden after this oversight line d5. And Fabiano uh, makes the move. Ray Robson goes in the think tank once more. He thought for nearly two minutes on this move, rook to d3. And now once again, he's using up many of his remaining precious seconds. That's a bit too much time when you start with a 10 minute game. It's 10 minutes plus two seconds. Once again, guys, the time you control for the entire game and having now a three minute disadvantage over the world number two, not a good sign. I would be not that surprised if Fabiano ends up winning this game after having a, an advantage, pawn up, then spoiling it. And now it may be back because of the time factor. Don't you wish that you could do that? You could just like make some several not very good moves and then just win anyway against a very strong player like Ray Robson. I always wish I could do that. Yeah, I wish. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, Robson, I mean, he may be just okay. In this position, I think like White has zero problems and maybe White is even better. I'm just a little worried that he has used so much time. So yeah. he may end up making mistakes because of the time trouble. I think you and I are both focusing on the practical elements of the yeah. time situation. We're saying that, yes, normally we'd be okay with well, rookie six, now king f7 comes with tempo. So maybe I'm becoming less and less thrilled. And there it is, king f7 attacking this rook. f5 played. Maybe this is okay, but rook to g4, doubling up rooks in the g file feels very tempting. I just, I'm not confident. There it is. So either it's great that I'm finding great moves or five is finding bad moves when I'm suggesting a move and he's playing. <laughs> Um, yeah, we shall see. I think this game will be interesting. Maybe it's going to end up in a draw as sometimes happens in chess. One had the advantage, then the other. And in the end, they shared a point. The player that was not likely to save half a point was Ivan Sharj. But now, if we look at his position, isn't he about to give perpetual check? Ivan Sharj. Whoa. Okay, so Sharj has his queen. He can just keep... Ch well, the king can run to b8 to a7. True. So that's not that's simple but i feel like he certainly has improved his chances and actually a big question on is actually is black really threatening anything because obviously rook takes f2 is a check but can my king somehow like go to g4 and then f5 and run away from everything like if that's whoa if that's possible then white isn't in too much danger right now so if that would mean rook takes e4 as a possibility but i'm i'm not totally convinced that it's going to happen so uh, so let's say rook takes e4, then rook f2 check, king g3, rook g2 check, king h3. No, you're probably getting checkmated as this queen comes to g2, and rook takes h5. Yeah, this is that would be bad. So you can't take on e4 right away, or else you're going to lose material in a very forcing line that white can't avoid. Um, just yeah. by a bunch of checks, winning the rook on e4. So rook takes e4 is not good, but maybe move like using your idea with a perpetual check, queen to e8, because that protects the pawn on h5 and threatens your queen e7 check ideas. That's true. And shout out to Grandmaster Georg Meyer, who is in the chat with us. He's saying about Fabiano's game that very often one inaccurate decision is enough against these guys to see them crawl back into the game. And that's exactly how it is on top level chess. Mm -hmm. One tiny mistake, an imprecise move, and that's it. Yep. Uh, definitely been there many times. I'm sure you have as well, Anna. We make one little error in judgment, and then all of a sudden we're just we're out of it. And it's really frustrating, especially when you're playing a good game. But that's chess for you. Sometimes it's just too bad. So, okay, queen e8 check did happen here. But the king's running to a7, and he took an e4 with the queen. But now after rook f2 check, I think a move like rook to f1 or rook to h2, giving my queen access to the f2 square, which would be a pretty annoying check. Looks pretty good. Maybe there's a, something better here as well. But I, I like just to th keep the threats up as white's pawns are all in danger of falling down. Like b4 is a weakness. So as, you know, in addition to the checkmating attack I'm trying to unleash. So rook to h2 or rook to f1, as I mentioned, seem to be very good plans to get this queen into the attack. Yeah, so it may not be the case that Shard survives. For a moment, I thought that he has better chances, but Alianov is still in control of this game. How is the, the main chess bra doing against Ituri Thaga? Ooh, I like your pronunciation there. So the main chess bra, that's <laughs> Eric Hansen against Ituri Thaga. Did I do it right? Did I do it right? Yeah, perfect. Hansen is losing 
because that Ooh, that's a, seven seconds left for Eric Hansen. Yeah, he went for a knight sack for an attack, but unfortunately for him, queen d2 protect his knight on d3, and the queen on g6 couldn't get into the action. I would play king to f2 here just to get out of the pin. Okay, king g2 similar, and now knight takes e5. White is simply up a minor piece with a outside past a pawn, and so this should be quite simple for Ituri Thaga. Did I do that right? Very good. Oof. Look at chess win with the Robert Hess emotes. Well, oh boy, I agree. Oh boy, I definitely <laughs> agree. What's up, chess win? Nice to see you here in the chat. And all right, so let's see. The game between, this game is over. The game between Robson and Caruana still lots of action here. Ray Robson once again up a pawn, and it looks like he's going to stay up a pawn, maybe go up a two pawn. So Robson on the better side of this end game once more. I, I just, this game has had many ups and downs, but Robson. Seven seconds left though for Ray Robson, so he has to speed up. He does, but this end game should be winning, right? The two pawns uh, against the lone rook and the one pawn on the king side is not enough in terms of compensation. What you would ideally like in an end game like this is to throw your pawn from f6 to b6 and your king over to b7 and just shift those over the b file. You'll make a pretty simple draw. Here, unfortunately, the a and b pawns push themselves. And so a5 here, even if you go f5, yeah. the a... My prediction was completely wrong. Actually, Ray Robson, even though he barely has time, he is going to beat the world number two. Yeah. So um, he's going to win. No, for sure. And this actually is a good omen for him going into the U.S. Chess Championships, which start next week. As he, yeah. 5 on a Caruana, of course, will be there trying to win another U.S. Chess Championship. Ray Robson still in the hunt for his first championship, but we will have a tough road ahead. And this could help him build confidence. I know it was a 10-minute game, but anytime you can beat 5 on a Caruana, that has to be a great sign for your chess playing ability. Yeah, I mean, even if... If you beat him in a Buckhouse game, you will say that, oh, I have won a game against Fabiano. Yeah, no, absolutely. I don't, I don't care if you're playing dominoes and beat him. You're still going to say you... Totally. Nobody... Or Avalon. I have beaten him in Avalon. Oh, are you... Did you? Yeah. Because he loves that well, game. But so... it's not like a one-on-one, one -on -one, of course. No, it's but... One against a couple of people against a couple of others. So, it's still yeah, something that you should be battles. proud of. Don't, don't sell yourself short here. You are <laughs> an Avalon champion against... Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> You beat him. Just don't don't let it, you know. So back to the game. <laughs> Fabiano Caron is going down in this Ruken game. Ilya Nizhnik, the teammate of Ray Robson, is in the chat. He has won his game against JJ. And now Fabiano goes down as well. So it's a brilliant start for the windmills, who definitely need their qualification spot. Drummaster Jon Ludwig Hammer is in the chat. Shout out to the captain of the Norway Gnomes. He's saying Avalon hype. Avalon hype, of course he is. You know, these chess players, for some reason, can't get enough Avalon. But right now, I think 5 and a Caruana hasn't had enough of Ray Robson. They'll meet again in the U.S. Chess Championship. So the Elyonov game against... Whoa, what happened here? So Sharich is going to make a draw. Black King is, oh. is in time to get to the corner here. So King E7, they'll repeat moves a little bit. But it looks like Sharich is... Somehow got the better side of this from what was a not good position, and he stalemate after King to F8, draw by stalemate. So we have a couple games left. I see Miranda here against Gusenov. Interesting rook end game, double rook end game, I should say. I don't know who's got better chance to win this game, white or black. Oof, let me catch up with that game. I was still looking at the end of Fabiano's game. So it's official. Ray Robson has just beaten Fabiano Caruana, and Sharic saves half a point against Ilyanov. This Rook M game, though. Ooh, look at that pin on the seventh rank. Rook F6. Yep, that is picking, trying to pick up this Rook on C7. Now, E4 saves your E pawn and goes after the H pawn. But Rook to C2 check. King she Rook to C3. Definitely some improvement there for Gusenov. So take on E4. Oh, can't take on E4, sorry. Take on F3. And is this good winning chances for white, or should it just be holdable? If this king can run to e6 very quickly, that's going to be a problem. But king f5, then there was rook a5 check. And the e5. G Interesting. Ah, game. another two on one. 17 seconds left for Gusainov. And let's just remember, it's 3 a.m. in Kazakhstan. Yeah, it's, he, it's very late for him. So he's, he's <laughs> it's up 3 a.m. for Mr. Gusainov at the moment. He's up way past his bedtime. 
right? Like, well, who knows? Actually, chess players are not night owls in general. I feel like so maybe three a.m. is not too bad, but when it's gonna be five a.m. and he's still playing. I mean, I'm definitely a night owl as well, so I, I, I got you. Ah, uh, me too, me too. And all right, so right now the white is trying to make progress here. Rook to d7 wins his e7 pawn. H5 I'd play, just keep pushing this pawn forward. It feels like Wojciech Miranda has been a great pickup for the New York Marshals this season. He's been playing very, very well, always extremely competitive. So even if he doesn't win his game or doesn't hold, it seems like for his team, like the morale, he's always in the running here. Now D3 and E7 are both under attack, and it's going to be too little too late for Gustav. Rook back to D7 behind the pawn. Now my king is going to run up to one of these squares at king f4. And that could force resignation king f5. And if you give me another check, my king's going up to f6 or g6. f6 probably. And yeah, looking good for the marshals. Uh, shout out to Gre Greg Shahari, the commissioner of the Protest League. And I was just looking at the comment that he, he made about the scoring system. So I wanted to ask Greg to help me clarify that that is exactly the system for this week's battle royale and it's not the same as previous ones so i i was mentioning earlier that the battle royales we have witnessed were 24 points for the first place 24 second 16 for third and so on and so on i may be mistaken and that means that this week is different and greg is saying it's 30 for the top place 25 for second 20 for the third is that the case greg that i was wrong earlier please correct me because I know that Anna, a very never few wrong. times, but it happens that sometimes Greg is right and Anna is not. No, that, that never happens, and we're not going to allow it on this stream. I'm just going to say it now. Anna, you're right. Greg is wrong. I don't care what he says. <laughs> well, this time, Greg was right. So I'm going to correct myself. This week, the Battle Royale has a different scoring system because it's an in-division Battle Royale. That's the difference. All the, the Battle Royales we have in this earlier were in, were in between divisions. So you saw a mix of teams from different groups. But today, every single Battle Royale is the same division and more points are there for grab. Yeah, and I put up the standings right now within the Battle Royale. You see that the New York Marshals have jumped three and a half points up. The pawn grabbers there of three out of four in their first match with the windmills led by Ray Robson, two and a half, and the chess bras and the champions split two two in that first uh, round of the battle royale. So that uh, at least is good news there for some of these teams. Shout out to the New York Marshals. <laughs> I see Crazy Coffee Man saying that I like how Levy, aka Gotham Chess, gave us that emote on the very last week of the PCN regular season. So yeah. But luckily, the marshals are about to qualify anyway, so you can use your emotes for a bit longer than some of the other teams. So, Anna, what do you make of this first round? So, you know, we see that the marshals are the big winners. They were leading the division anyway. Uh, any surprises thus far? You still think it, you know, all makes sense. Too early to tell. Um, it's early, but I'm a bit surprised by how the archbishops went down against the windmills. They started with promising positions, not just that they are one of the highest rated team, uh, highest rated, the rating average has to be similar, but I mean, in the sense that Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So, their ratings count as if it was less. So they count as 2700s, even though their ratings are higher than that. That's the regulation in the protest league. So anyone who is above 2700 counts as 2700. And we also have a different category for, for female players and also for players rated below 2000. But Without going into those details, I just wanted to say that they have like one of the most full of celebrity teams, the Archbishops, and they are the leaders of the Atlantic Division. So I, I expected them to just smash everyone today, <laughs> score a lot of points. And I, I actually chose them for my fantasy pick for the Atlantic Division, but it's not happening. Yep. No, I mean, they, of course... It never happens. It never happens. There's 20K. Did you guys Did you guys fill out the bracket for the Pro, Pro Chess League Fantasy competition? Because it's $20,000 at stake. $20,000 I, for this league. Now that you mention the money, I wish I had filled it out, but unfortunately I didn't. Uh, every time I fill out a fantasy bracket, I get it wrong, and it just is a little frustrating for me but don't tell me about it i'm never in the top 200 even top 200 i can't make it into the top 200 well you're number one in the chest 
TV, uh, twitch.tv slash chess is fans hearts and the chess.com TV. So maybe you're 200 oh. in those brackets, but Greg Shahadi's <laughs> opinion of you doesn't matter. Shout out to Commissioner Greg Shahadi. But no, Anna, <laughs> uh, I get you. I feel you. It's just very tough to know who's going to play well in a given day because there's so many kind of equal matchups going on. And the one I have here with Eric Hansen, the white pieces against Sergey Ehrenberg with black. Both these are very yeah. tough competitors in the Pro Chess League and very strong grandmasters. And once again, we see a Karo Khan where Black's position is very solid, but all of a sudden White has an extra pawn thanks to this capture on h5. And this Bishop on g4 looks like a weird piece, but it's keeping everything together. If you ever take me on g4, I take back with my h pawn, fixing my pawn yeah. structure and protecting this pawn on h5. So I don't know about you, Anna. I really like White's position in the early going of this game. I think the same. So it looks weird, yes, the pawn structure, but as Robert highlighted, the trade on g4 with straight and white's pawn chain, and it's difficult to attack this king, even though there's no g pawn. Um, there are more white pieces on the king side, and also black's king is still in the middle of the board too. So there's no such way as tearing up the king side, the g and f fives, and mating white's king. So you're saying black's gonna cast along and play f6 or g6 and just go for it. Sorry, I'm being roasted by Greg Shahadi in the chat, so I couldn't focus on the variation. Oh, no. It's I... okay, Greg. No more donuts for you when you visit. <laughs> I, I was saying, um, are you, you, know, you seem to suggest that Black is in the castle long and play Freddy as like F6 or G6 and try to open up the position uh, because White has compromised the pawn structure over there on the king side. I cannot comment. <laughs> Oh, you and Greg are still having a battle in the chat over there? <laughs> yeah, All right. just a little bit. I'm, I won't even react to it. <laughs> I won't even react. You're above it's it. Okay. Well, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to win that 10 or 20K in the playoffs. You guys will see. You will see. And uh, Blue Wizard, that's Dennis Boros, says Hungarians rule. So there's a shout out to you, Anna, because... Well, well, thank you so much. <laughs> and shout out to the, all the Hungarian viewers, even though they may be um, Sleeping? a small group of our audience. But hello, everyone looking, watching us from Hungary. <laughs> Number two in hat choices today. Tommy, well, it happens. I can't always wear a hat, can I? It's on the wall. It's behind me. If you guys are missing the hat, it's behind me. Well, maybe I should get a hat. That way, you know, they don't have to miss yours if I'm wearing one, right? We're a team, so... What happens with one of us kind of affects the other. So maybe I should just go put on a hat, right? Yeah, well, I have never seen you wearing a hat, Robert. What hat would you choose? I don't know. I don't really own many hats. So I, that would be a, that's a tough call, honestly. Well, we can go shopping uh, at the PCL finals. So what kind of hat would you look for? I mean, if we're going to... This is a very important discussion now. So it's a break from the analysis of Grandmaster Games. This is so important. Well, we'll talk about this when we go shopping together, because I don't want everybody knowing my style here. And can we talk a little bit more about Greg Shahadi? <laughs> <laughs> let's go back to the games. Yeah, before we, before we lose track forever, <laughs> let's go to the games here. And I have the game between Elyanov with the white pieces against uh, Wojciech Miranda. And Miranda with the black pieces is faced in opening here on the king side with his pawn going to h5 some point going to take on g6 open the h file but black's king tends to be safe for the time being with a bishop on g7 it's a very important piece covering the h square from h8 square excuse me from any che checkmate so on the flip side white has a hard time figuring out what to do with his king because you're a castle queen side then this bishop barrels down the long diagonal and you might have some trouble yourself so interesting dynamic right here i like how miranda has been playing in the pro chess league so I, mean, I, I, I think white is definitely better because of the, I, yeah. I like this pawn chain from g2 to d5, though I think that there are going to be plenty of counterattack chances for Miranda if he's able to stymie white's pieces the next few moves. I'm curious what's going to happen to the white king. That's another question. When you see that the king is still in the middle of the board, of course, he doesn't really want to castle king side. That's where he has an open h5 for his rook. But if he castles queen side, then black will try to push b5 and attack through the long diagonal as well with this g7 bishop. Yeah, so maybe knight b6 is a good starting move. Just trying to trade off my knight on d7 that's not doing anything for your knight on c4 that's putting pressure on my d6 pawn. So if I play knight to b6 and you take me, my b double b pawns are backwards, but this semi-open a file could come in very handy 
to fight off against any sort of rook movement from the a1 square. It just seems like that creates a double-edged dynamic. Yeah, I think we can come back to this game a little bit later Ooh. because I see Miranda taking his time. How about this game between Kevin Carl with the black piece and Sean Rodrigue Lemieux? That is uh, FM Sean RL123 mm -hmm. against Spartan Carl. Well, Carl better be a Spartan here because his king is looking to be ripped open. Although White's king Ouch. already is mm -hmm. ripped open and black is up two pawns. So I would imagine black is better here with the extra material but both kings are feeling very unsafe here. I agree with you. It's a competition which king which king is going to be weaker, but I'm a fan of having an extra pawn or two, so I, I would say, yeah, black should be better, even if he has to dance with his king around the middle of the board. Yeah, now the king actually just, you said, it's going to run over to maybe c7 or c8, and it should be safe. The queen, at some point, would love, absolutely love to get to the h4 square from d8. And this came from a French defense, Anna. Ooh, what a surprise. The best opening in the world. It is a surprise because how in the world is Black's light square bishop on g4? Like, this is a French. How did your bishop get here? Magic. Yeah. It's called magic. It's called... It's a kind of magic. <laughs> it's, it's called self-destruction from Sean I'm going to use your emote in the chat. Finally, it makes sense. Together with the heart, it means you love the French defense. Uh... Uh, it's just, it hurts so much. Robert, 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 can you remind me what did you say when I asked you on air, which one is your least favorite and favorite opening? The French. You said both. My French right? is the, the favorite. French is your least favorite and also your favorite. The French is my favorite to hate and it's my least favorite to see in action. However, somehow by move 20, this has become the best French I've ever seen in my life because black is up two pawns and attacking white's king and the bishop's on g4 rather than on c8. So everything has gone right for Kevin Carl. Everything has gone wrong for Sean Rodrigue Lemieux. And here, I don't know, bishop takes knight on f3, rook takes f3, make king c6, so I can go bishop c5 next. This position is just terrible for white here. Just really, really bad position. Yeah, I completely agree. Of course, uh, it's still requires precision because the position is so sharp it's so open that black has to play the absolutely best moves but i agree with you that this is a dream position i would take any day in the french yeah i would play the french if i get a position like this but you tend never to be able to get something like this so don't play the french Sa says the guy who had a pawn up against vichy anand yep so on that note i'm switching games so i don't have to look at the <laughs> french anymore oh an end game between ray robson the hero of the first round versus Gadir Gusenov. And in this position, it's even material, but black has a very ugly pawn structure. But in return for that ugly pawn structure, a rook on the semi open C file hitting this pawn on C2. Uh, let me catch up with you. I lost that game for a moment. Okay. okay. Yeah, Gusenov, once again, he's a participant of, at the world team championship representing azerbaijan and they have a round tomorrow so we are curious to see if he's gonna play because it's half past three almost in the morning in kazakhstan and he's playing here in the pro chess league yep because he can't get enough pro chess league can he he just wants to play the montclair sopranos relying on him to help them secure that final playoff spot but right now the live stands and just to remind everybody i'm gonna pull up the uh, standings before today's action just to keep everything clear so the sure. standings that you see on the screen right now before i pull up the other graphic are if it is over then like if the results that are currently up were over that's what it would be but the standings before today's action saw the montclair sopranos down nine and a half points to the montreal chess bras and down 11 points to the windmill so it is very close the sopranos have to do a couple places better than the chess bras to qualify for the playoffs and we'll keep this live scoreboard going just so everyone can continue to see how the action is affecting the standings and the, from the first round the sopranos only scored half a point so they've dropped to the bottom of the, the chess bras and the windmills had at least two points in that first round so again it's still very early only the second round of the battle royale plenty of time left for the sopranos to play catch up but anna they're board four tom bartell I mm -hmm. think he forfeited both the first two games. You're kidding. Let me let me verify that. Again? Uh, yeah, I think so. Let me see. 
How's that possible? He forgot that he has to play today. I don't know. Let me let me verify. But he could be playing. I, d I just don't see his. Oh no, he's there. Found him. He's playing now. So That's he, so what Greg he, is saying. Yeah, he only forfeited the first game. He's playing this game here against Joshua Grabinski, and well, Tom Martel may be playing this game, but he's down what uh, an exchange and a pawn. But then item B six is trapped, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Thanks everyone. Also, Eric, Greg, who helped us figuring out that yeah, this game is actually going on. So Thomas may have forgotten about the start of the round today, but he's here, and his position is a very exciting one. Who is better here? Uh, I would imagine Black is doing quite well because if this knight is trapped, you have two minor pieces for the rook, and here's knight takes c4, so just take that on c4. And what's his plan now? If you're queen d3, hitting bishop on f3, knight on c4, I go bishop to d5, protecting both at once. I think Black is now just close to winning. And the reason why I feel so confident saying that is that the bishop on f3 is so strong. It's on this diagonal where at some point, if I can put my bishop back to a8 and then my queen to c6, I'm going to go to try to checkmate you along this long diagonal. So uh, the e5 pawn is hanging. If you don't take my knight on c4, everything is pointing in black's favor right now. Yeah, I agree with you that Thomas is doing very well. I see Lev is saying in the chat, what happened to the Sopranos 3GM lineup? Yeah, the Sopranos are uh, the, one of the teams that actually cannot benefit these weeks um, the fact that uh, the FIDE World Team Chess Championship is also taking place these days, and they have top three of their top players in Kazakhstan at the moment. Now, we have witnessed that for some, it doesn't matter. Gadir Gusainov is fighting for his team, even though it's half past three in the morning in Kazakhstan, and he may need to finish his games at half past five in the morning and then go and play a classical chess game at the World Team Championship, which is like a top event. Yeah, so either he has the most stamina of any chess player in the world, or he's taking the round off, or he's going to play and maybe not do so well because he's tired. But uh, that remains to be seen. Tom Bartel doing well in this game, so I think Black is going to win. So the Sopranos are going to try to bounce back. What other games can we look at now that this game should... Oh my gosh, the game between FM Sean and... And that's Sean Rodrigue Lemieux and Kevin Carl has turned where somehow really? now Sean Rodrigue Lemieux is up a piece for two pawns. And granted, this bishop on c1 is not good. The rook on b1 can't go anywhere quite yet. But white is up a piece. And I don't know. This is actually very How unclear. How did that position. happen? I, I wish I could tell you. So bishop g6 check. <sighs> Went to queen d4, took... Oh, look at that tactic. Rook h4 and move 24 for black. Rook takes f8, distracting the queen from the defense of this rook on h4. Oh, no. That's a beautiful tactic, honestly. And From a dream French, it turned into a nightmare French. Yes, and that's what happens when you play the French. Things go wrong. Excuse me, it wasn't the fault of the opening. He had a winning position, potentially winning position. Potentially, but now it's back to a game and, well, we're talking about the French, so I'm going away. We have the game between Ituri Zaga. We need to go away because this is too sad, yes. Too sad. The game between Ituri Zaga and Sergei Azarov, where, well, black has its extra two pawns, but white is currently threatening to go queen e8 check and pick up this pawn. Oop, my arrows are doing them too many times. Queen e8 check takes mm -hmm. f7 is clearly the threat. So queen to b8 was played. The next one will be queen to a8. And then this A pawn starts pushing for black. Ituri Zaga should be winning this game with two extra pawns. Yes. Uh, he, it's a good start for Ituri Zaga after beating Eric in the first round. Yeah. And he, Ituri Zaga, I'm going to keep working on that. Um, the, Very good. The, the thing is, he can put his queen on A8. Beautiful. And if this queen comes to G5 to H6 then black always has queen to f8. So I can always make sure I'm not getting checkmated and I can continue trying to push this pawn. So he pushed the pawn first. Now I'll move like queen to e8, which is played. And now this e-pawn can also start pushing. So that's the good thing for black's position is now e5 is clearly a move that can be played and the queen can start swinging around the board as long as the king doesn't 
find itself checkmated with this queen hopping in the g7 square. But the queen's very far away from getting to g7, and black can always play queen f8, as mentioned before. So it looks good for the champions. Yeah, this is going to be a win champions. for Iturizaga and the Miami champions. The champions, as we already highlighted earlier, are fighting for not being relegated. So there are five teams in the Atlantic Division that want to get one of the qualification spots. So five teams fighting for the top four places. And at the bottom, we have three teams trying not to be relegated. Two of them will have to say goodbye unless they manage to come back with the qualification tournament, but they will have to fight their way back. So it's tough. Some teams are about to continue in the playoffs. Others are going to say goodbye to the Proches League and to you guys. That would be heartbreaking for those teams. But as we mentioned before, Anna, you're the sa you're sad about it. I'm like, ah, oh, it's part of the league. So, um, you know, just, just very straightforward about it. And, okay, Miranda with the black pieces. I think Elyanov is making progress here as his pawn has reached d6. White can play queen to d5 to trade off the queens at some moment and go after the c5 pawn. So I like Elyanov's position and I like the Miami champions' chances of... Wait. Okay, I like their chances of coming back here in the, uh, the division to not get relegated. Mm, yes, yeah. They actually made a big step in not getting relegated with last week's victory. So they faced the division leader, St. Louis Archbishops, and they managed to beat them in week nine's match. That was, I think, a huge step in keeping their position in the Proches League. So beating the champions, I mean, current leaders of their division was a huge result. Yep, and they're doing so well that um, it seems like they broke the scoreboard. That's how well they're doing today relative to how they've been doing in the past. So <laughs> BGH says, I'm not heartless. Uh, depends on the day of the week. Sometimes I can be heartless. Other times I can be perfectly kind. You haven't read out the rest of the comment. He's saying that you're a saint. I agree with BJ. Oh, I'm definitely not a saint. You are a saint. Nope, definitely not. Because that, okay. that means I'll have to go marching in and, well, I'm seated, seated right now. I don't want to move. <laughs> All right, so what are the games? Plenty of time trouble going on. I see Kieran Griffith with the white pieces playing Brian Tillis. And I think Tillis is just mating. Oh, no, that's a queen on G1. I thought the queen was on H1. The king was on G1. But Ooh, rook takes, yeah, that's a queen. Rook takes H3 is a big threat, threatening checkmate. And yep. I actually don't know how white stops that because your queen H2, I go bishop F4. That way, mm -hmm. if you move your queen to g1, I'll take on h3 again and give you a checkmate. And if you have to take on f3, then you're just completely lost. Because taking on f3, bishop h2, king h2, and queen takes f3, well, then black's up a queen and three pawns for two rooks. That's way too much material. And it looks like Brian Tillis, we keep you on the champions games unintentionally, but they're winning across the board. They are. Yeah, and the champions are on fire. Those of you asking how can players like Shahri Armanjarov uh, participate in the team of San Jose, for instance, and there are other foreigners in different teams that you may see in the lineup, every team can have one free agent per match. So they can register as many free agents as they like. They don't have to live in the city that they represent, but only one free agent can play per match. So for instance, the San Jose Hackers, they're not playing in this division, but you guys are talking about them. They have Mamedyarov, Mamedov, and Safarli, the top three Azeri players on their lineup, and they're all free agents. They don't live in San Jose. That's right. And while you were giving that great explanation, I pulled up Fabiano Caruana's game, and he won because he's, oh. his queen's in F3 here, threatening bishop to H3 with queen G2 mate. The only way for Melchizedek to have stopped that was playing queen e2 instead of resigning. But after queen takes e2, rook takes e2, bishop g4, that is a skewer on both rooks, picking up one of them for the bishop, and then black would be up two pawns in an easily winning rook end game. So Melchizedek threw in the towel rather than suffering. And Raven Sturt has 2.5 seconds left against Ilya Nizhnik, but unfortunately for Sturt, well, it's also a lost position. So no time left on the clock. Position is lost. Nizhnik picking up a victory against the Sopranos. The Sopranos keep, keep seeing them struggle here. That's not going to be good news for them, but though Gusenov did beat Ray Robson in their head-to-head -head matchup, that's a good result for oh, the Sopranos. Uh, so. That's important, especially taking into account that Ray Robson is coming from a victory over Fabiano Caruana. 
Yep. And I pulled up the game between Amit Gassi and Wesley So, because who doesn't want to see Wesley So play? He's up a piece against the London Lion, and that should be a swift victory for So. So I'm going to keep going around. There are not that many games, and a lot of them are in time trouble. Yeah, I'm also making a little tour. I keep coming back to this French defense <laughs> between Sean Rodrigue Lemay and Kevin Carl. The current position, wait a second, things have changed. No, White they is up. Change. Yeah, They didn't change, it's just way worse. <laughs> <laughs> White's just simply up so much material, but... Move, let's move on, let's move watch on. Watch out we for stalemates, Anna. Oh, no. there, there are some stalemating ideas if you leave that bishop on b8 and the rook cuts off the king, that I would be able to sacrifice my rook, but that's why bishop c7 is a good move. It can still be stalemate. What's that? Take that rook. That's a free rook. <laughs> Terrible, let's move on. Okay, sorry about you. I your... think black wants to get stalemated, but no. It's not stalemate. Uh, right. Game over. It's called game over. So, let's see. Michael Kleinman versus Tuan Min Le is still going on. And that looks fairly interesting. Rook, Bishop in three versus Rook, Knight in three. And what is happening here? Black doesn't have much time. White is slightly better. I'll play Rook F5 and then try to push one of your pawns on the queen side. But instead, put centralize the Rook with Rook D4. Now... Rook d8 was played, trying to go with rook a8. Wait, doesn't rook a8 pick up a pawn? Yes, it does. It has just been played. And that's a free pawn. Take twice an a5. Free stuff. Okay, not taking it yet, though. Take and then take. Take now. He's going to take twice on a5. He's got more time on the clock. The only good thing for black is that there's not much material on the board. But for now, it's a bishop and two pawns running versus a knight and one pawn. So... It's all the winning chances for White. He just has to be careful so that not all the material will disappear from the board and he will end up having Rook and Bishop versus Rook. Right. Um, yeah, so right now Black is just trying to keep active. The knight in g5 is very well placed. The pawn h6 protects it. And the knight in g5 stops anything from going to e4 square. So it's, it's going to sit here for a while. c5 being played it puts the pawn in a dark square. But if white feels comfortable with rook c4, getting the rook behind the pawn, but then knight f3 checks, so you know, rook f5 instead. And that's not a square you typically want to be on because your bishop is stuck, tied down to the rook's defense. And it looks like rook, yeah, rook a3 makes perfect sense here. So don't go king d2 because then I take on d3 with check and then pick up your rook. Yeah, but now the same trick, rook takes c2 is a threat. And where do you place the rook? The pawn is gone. That's it. Black has managed to pick up the pawn. Yeah, Black picked up that pawn. He's going to give up the H pawn, but then play a move like, I don't know, knight to F3. Oh, almost lost on time. Got to be careful in a situation like this. Ooh, one second left. Wow. Bishop B3, rook. Okay, just moving the king in. I like that. Bishop C4. Play what? Rook H8 now. There it is. Oh, rookie a check. Where's your king? Oh, king f5, bishop d3. Resigns. Yep. Loses the piece. Blunder. And almost flags. Flag. Ooh. Bishop d3. Oh, not there. There. And king f3. Oh, king f3 mate on f2. Don't play king f3. Yeah, that would have been a huge blunder. Instead of winning a piece, steps into mate. Wow. We actually... Wait, now that's a free piece. What? Why did he... He should have given a check again on a2. So, and it's game over. Missed opportunities what there. What a turnaround, but in the end, White wins. After having blundered his C-pawn, and Black was back in the game, but then Black, Black blundered his piece, and White did not blunder into mate. Yep. Happens. And here, I have this last game of the round up between Andy Horton with the Black piece and Josh Bloomer. With white, rook and four, rook and four. Better king for white, farther up the board, more advanced. Rook g7 played, coming after the g5 pawn. And after king f6, I wonder if rook h7 is in time. Or black is going to try to go rook e8 check, rook down e2 at some moment if you aren't careful. So it's an annoying position. Yeah, repeating moves. Oh, playing oh, on. Black decides not to repeat. But not king d5. Yeah, why is Black so brave in this position where he may be worse? He's going to go rook e2 and try to take g2 and then play rook to g3 and try to take one of the remaining pawns. But after king d5, take on d6, take on c5, that c pawn is rolling pretty quickly. Uh, I would be worried from White's perspective here because um, you're, 
taking a bunch of pawns. You took d6 with check, now you're taking c5. But once g2 falls, I mean, really, this rook g3 plan is coming. So white, I guess, rook e5 is a good looking move. Rook g3 now. Yeah. Well, king f6 is a waste of time. Now king d6. Whoa, I, don't, I really don't know what's happening here. Is it because of the rating difference that black was pushing so hard to try to win this game? Probably. King d6. So we see that white has a rating of 1900 and black is almost 2400. Yep. It's a 500 rating point difference, but white has been playing very well in this game. So shout out to Judge Bloomer, all of you who are supporting the St. Louis Archbishops. He has been fighting so well and he may be just winning. But wait, no, rook c3. He was still in time. Not anymore. Now, this is bad. This can't be the right defense. Yeah, because now you've given up. You've, White's given up the pawns, but now move like king d7. Yep. Although maybe king d7 wasn't right. Maybe king c6 was slightly better. Because that way you would have had your king closer to the pawns. Now c8 equals queen, takes, takes. And now play king h4. And after rook d3, play g4. And that should be... So rook d3 looks like it cuts everything off. And then black plays g4 here. Uh, so king takes h3 is immediately a draw. Rook g5, f3. Yeah. And my king and pawn will work together. White will sacrifice. And a draw will be agreed. I felt like white must have had something after rook a8 because it seemed too slow. But maybe I was wrong. Yeah. So here... In the end, it's a draw for smooth as a hedgehog. <sighs> Smooth as a hedgehog. I remember that was uh, a wrench hog, right? That's what you guys were talking about last week. Yeah, Mr. Danny Wrench, who's not going to be here today. Robert has replaced him. Robert, are you ready for a double shift? Uh, no, because I'm not doing a double shift. So <laughs> I, I don't want to be ready for one that is not what I'm doing today. But um, just for everyone in the chats here, right now, five out of eight archbishops, five out of eight champions. And then you can see the rest of the standings here. So the Sopranos made a good comeback in that round and look at wesley so he's in the game chat cheering on his teammate josh bloomer said <laughs> great work drawing against a much higher rated player if wesley wow. so is not the best team in the world i don't know who is he's amazing and he's so active in the chess.com chat so you guys should all go to chess.com live chess and watch all the games of the archbishops because you may be able to chat with grandmaster wesley so there in the chat box of chess.com he's just so active cheering on his teammates i love it yeah he's he's a great supporter of his fellow archbishops and now that i have the standings back up there again anna the sopranos tied with the windmills at three and a half there remember we said that before the day started the sopranos yeah. had to leapfrog the chess bras and or the windmills right you just needed to get ahead of one of those teams to make the fourth and final playoff spot. Right now, the chess bras are doing solidly, four and a half points. The windmills tie with the Sopranos, and so we got to play a quick catch up. And so let's take a peek at, ooh, there's a matchup between these very teams. The Sopranos are playing the Archbishops, and so that means Gadir Gusenov is black against Fabiano Caruana. Not the matchup you're looking for. Wesley So is black against Nicholas Cheka, newly minted Grandmaster Nicholas Cheka, I might add, uh, from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is a 17-year-old player from the New York area, and he plays for Montclair. So he's a new grandmaster in the United States, but Wesley So is not such a new grandmaster and is, of course, very, <laughs> very, 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 very strong. Um, Isn't Wesley So also one of the Pro Chess League participants with one of the cutest profile pictures? Which, Can we just give a shout-out to Wesley's profile picture on Jazz.com? It's Jinxie Cat from um, Meet the Parents. Not actually. Oh, I didn't know it's a famous cat. No, I no, I don't think it is. It's a cute cat. It's definitely cute. The eyes are very blue there. Um, also, Fabiano hasn't played a move yet. So does anyone know Fabiano is at his board? Because I just pulled up his game and he has spent a minute plus on his first move. So... Yes, so this is something that I think Pro Chess League Commissioner Greg Shahadi can confirm whether Fabiano Caron is taking a bathroom break, which may be the case. All the players have their webcams on. This is part of the regulation that they are being monitored. This is, of course, to avoid that. It's the person that is supposed to be playing is the one that is moving the mouse. So that 
is the reason why there's a webcam on everyone and also for extra entertainment the next battle royale broadcast will include i believe the webcam so you will be able to see some of these focused faces hopefully yeah that was very fun last week seeing the uh, sleeping windmill that was <laughs> still one of the oh, funniest let's moments just, let's just get some of those emotes in the chat by the way one of the newest emotes on chess channels is the Zzz. Sounds like a buzzsaw. Okay, Fabiano <laughs> has made some moves, so it's confirmed that he was just away from the computer. Glad to see that he's not just going to lose on time as well. You we always want to see Fabiano Caruana games. But I have this game open between Ivan Sharic and Sergei Mosesyan. It's from a Sicilian. It kind of looks like a French. There's a bishop on c8 that is stuck behind a wall of pawns. But in all seriousness, this is actually a very flexible structure for black because you might want to play c5 at the right moment. The problem with playing c5 is often meant by white playing c4. And once that yeah. dynamic occurs, I'm continuously threatening to take this pawn on d5 there, if you ever play c5, and if you ever play d4, so let's say c5, c4, d4, just to show that on the board, yes, you may open up the diagonal, but white can make a trade there. But if my knight reroutes up to d3, you have this pawn on c5 that's stuck there and will need defense and kind of uh, clogs the position for black's pieces, the bishop on e7 and knight on d7. So g6 played instead, c4 anyway. And now if you take on d5, I can take with my c pawn, so it's not like I have to touch that pawn on d5 yet. So rook h5 coming right after e5. Yeah, it's a logical move to put pressure on the e5 pawn, but it's fairly easy to protect it by pushing f4 or playing bishop to f4. Yeah, bishop f4 play just to not commit this pawn to f4 yet and ruin the dark squares and keep your bishop stuck behind the pawn knight c5. That's why you didn't want to play c5 yet. The knight came to c5 where it attacks this bishop on d3. Black is gaining activity. But okay, this is, there are going to be more games that are exciting. I see the Iturizaga game. Fasif Dor Bailey somehow just lost his h6 pawn. Like, where did... Oh, let me check that one. How did that happen? He castled. White went e4 and simply went ahead and took the pawn h6. That's a free pawn. I like it. Yeah. Free stuff. And no compensation for black. It's like, gave a pawn, don't even have anything to show for it. Now sacrifices on e5 are about to happen, so you might need to play f6. But if you play f6, you sort of have a passive-looking position. Yeah, not perceived Dora Bailey's game in this one. Not, not the best game of his life. I... I wonder why it never happens to me when I play against these 2600 GMs that they just drop a pawn randomly on move 14. Yeah, that doesn't happen to unfair. me either. Unless, unfair. Unless Life is unfair. Only when I set up games against myself does a GM blunder <laughs> on move 14. I'm like, oh, this move looks pretty good. Oh, wait a second, that just blunders the entire position. <laughs> so, yeah, well, um, unfortunately, I don't get that benefit. So let's go to the game between Karwana and... Gadir Gusenov, just because Gusenov has started spending some time on the clock, but in a position like this, I don't mind having the black side. In fact, I prefer it. And the reason why I like black's position is at some point I can crack the center with f7, f6. Not right now. Your king's still in the center. You're not really ready to do that. But if you play a move like bishop to g or e7, castle king side, and then play pawn to f6, you're just cracking open white's extended center here. Not to mention you could take on e3 at the right moment if you see when you should. So I would play, as mentioned, bishop to, I think bishop g7, but I'm not sure which is better. Bishop e7, I, I can't tell the difference right now. So it's just a strategic mm -hmm. thing where this bishop can even go to g5. Uh, I guess you can play h5 as well if you're black, just stopping this bishop from coming to g4 to attack this knight on f5. And once you play h5, you're saying, well, how are you going to make take advantage of this? You can't move your bishop on e3. You need it to protect d4. I don't know. I really like black's position here. It's a... Uh, very nice looking structure without a light square bishop. Are you saying that you like this position for black because it looks just like a French defense? Uh, actually, kind of, yes. And the reason <laughs> why I like the French defense stru uh, structure is that when you have this position where your e-pawn protects d5, white doesn't have the same benefit. This pawn d4 is protected by minor pieces, but not a pawn. And a pawn's best friend is another pawn. You really like to be defended that way. And so bishop g7 was played, bishop g4 followed up. And this is good news for Caruana, because if you take and now f takes, now this pawn d4 is very safe, whereas before it was a bit of danger. So castling kingside, then playing moves like queen g5 or pawn h5 or f6 or h5. I mean, just 
like I don't know which move to play here. So many different options. And I like Black's flexibility. Controlling that pawn break, pawn to f6, leaves Gusenov ahead in my book. Yes, I think Gusenov is doing very well. A small factor to take into account that it's going to be 4 a.m. in Kazakhstan very shortly. But as we said, most chess players, most professional chess players are night owls. So maybe it would have been more difficult for him if he had to play at 6 in the morning and not at 4 in the morning. So making it a late round may be actually easier for chess players than having to get up super early and still not being actually awake. Yep, totally with you there. And well, Anna, you're a French structure player. F6 here or do you delay F6 and find something else to do? F6. If if there's nothing concrete against F6, then you've got to play F6. And yeah, I have already showed my love for this amazing pawn structure in the chat by using an emote that I stole from another channel. It's a Robert's channel, by the way. And if you move your mouse, are there? Yeah, they are there. If you move your mouse over to where Robert's camera is, between Robert's camera and the scoreboard, you can click on Grandmaster Robert Hess's channel. He's going to start streaming regularly very soon. So yep. if you want to see Robert almost every day of your life, then go to his channel, follow and subscribe because he's going to be on Twitch very shortly, almost every single day. Isn't that true, Robert? It's very true. And, um, you know, there's a certain event going on that games are every day. It might be 11 rounds. It might be played in the Ooh. U.S. You know, not to give, <laughs> to give a few hints of the type of, streaming I will be doing, some of the coverage I'll be doing. So, you know, you can figure it out, read between the lines, and, well, come to my channel to watch. But he did not play F6, Anna, so that upsets both of us. Because now oh. that he didn't play F6, he's not Why going not? to play F6. Why not? Because you suggested it, and he was like, well, if Anna suggests it's too good, and I can't do it. <laughs> I like your comment. You turned it. You turned yeah. it in the right moment. I was already rolling my eyes. You're, uh, well, but I know Robert is very nice. He would never be like mean, as mean as I am to Alexandra in the sub battles. You're definitely not mean, and there's no. Ooh, no you way. didn't see those sub battles. We go for each other. No, good, but that's part of the you know it's part of the game. There, it's not mean. <laughs> Trash talking on top level. I I watched a bit of it. I, I heard it. So you uh, definitely held your own in the trash talk battle, but. Thank you. We're... I was practicing. I was watching a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's hilarious. It's so funny. Um, so what other games are interesting here? Because we'll come back to this game. It's a bit closed for now. Black keeps going bishop h6 to g7. White doesn't have a clear way to make progress. Maybe king h2, rook g3 or something like that, but it looks a long way away from true progress. So what other games can we dive into here that are of note? Um, a question from F Philip uh, is the game of Brian Tillis that he has been thinking for a few minutes already. Has he fallen asleep? That's my question then. Who is Brian Tillis playing against? Uh, let me find his game and I'll tell you. He's f uh, facing Joshua Grabinski and he is indeed down to 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Okay, let me try to find this But he has, he has made a move after thinking for five to six nope. minutes. In a 10-minute game, spending half of your time on one minute is not a good idea. I just What, what are the usernames for these people? Um, they are called Shrilla and Matchmate. Got it. So you said Brian Tillis spent a bunch of time. and is... Yeah, he was just a bit sleepy, I think. I'm going to use that emote, just in case. <laughs> Well, right now, this position is clearly favorable for black because this pawn on d4 do dominates and restricts white's minor pieces, right? You can't go to e3 or c3 with your knights. And white, on the other end, can try to play for f4 and a pawn break. But as soon as you go f4, black can even just sit with pawn to f6. So I really like black's position here. Knight c8, knight b6, maybe knight a4, trying to go to c3. That's a, a long journey, but perhaps black can make use of it. Grabinski throwing his knights around. And wait, what is this? He's going for the rook trade. Okay. The question, I guess you were wondering whether there's any discovered attack now that the a2 bishop is in the air. So if the knight from c2 could jump, for instance, knight takes d4, but his point must be that later the b4 pawn will be in the air as well. 
Yeah, so just go ahead and take the B4 pawn. Saying it's a trade. You didn't lose the pawn, but this B pawn is passed, and it's a good knight against a terrible light square bishop that's yeah. stuck on G2. So that's actually a very good decision there by Grabinski. This bishop could go to B1 now, where it attacks the knight on D3 and puts pressure on D3, or it can just go to B3. It's more realistic to attack this knight on C2 and then get rid of the defense of this pawn on B4. So maybe knight... You a knight a3, that way I can go after the b5 pawn. That seems like a reasonable strategy, but still, the d3 pawn is always going to be weak in an endgame like this, and I think Grabinski is just better with the black pieces. Mm -hmm. I agree. That is a dream position when you have a good knight versus bad bishop, plus a pawn that, for you, it's a pass pawn, and for the opponent, he's just got a backward pawn that is a weakness. Yep. No, definitely. So Grabinski doing some good work for the windmills, Let's let me try to find a soprano game, as you know, various influential for the standings here. The sopranos need to catch up. So, who on the sopranos can we go to right now? Let's see. Um, I'm gonna go and find some of the most exciting. So games Wesley So is done. playing Nicholas Cheka. I feel like that's a game we haven't looked at, and also what? we should read what Wesley says in the chat. <laughs> yeah, we so part we, of the analysis. We always enjoy when Wesley's game is done, not because we don't love watching him play but because he's always chatting, rooting his teammates on, just giving analysis about various games. So here he is the black pieces against Nicholas Cheka went d4. So white is going to play knight to e2, and that knight on e2 comes after both the f4 and the d4 pawns. I'm not sure how black is really following this up. I guess knight e2, knight c4, trying to come to the e3 square as possible, but I still, I'm going to trade queens on f4, and it doesn't look so threatening for black. Yes, I wonder what's going to happen now after the d4. So the knight is under attack and doesn't have many squares. Knight to e2, knight to a2. Right. I, I mean, knight e2 makes so much more sense than knight a2, right? So you don't want to... Yeah, so those are the two options. And then the black knight is coming. So knight c4. Black is not worried that both that the f4 pawn can be taken with like three pieces of white yeah. one is a check queen takes f4 but you you want to end up taking with the pawn right because you're that yeah, fixes your pawn totally. structure so queen f4 queen f4 g takes f4 check it fixes the pawn structure in a way that allows white to claim maybe only a slight disadvantage in the end game and it looks like that just happened d3 the pawn is very advanced and now it can even go to d2 next but white should probably put this knight on c3. And by putting on c3, you're covering the promotion square. And that's very important so that maybe you can get your rooks into the game and active. Yeah, I agree with you that after knight c3, it does look like black has an advantage, but it may have been bigger earlier because now at least finally white has got a much healthier pawn structure and the knight from c3 is controlling the d1 square. Yeah, maybe Cheka has good chances of survival. Although, he's got less time and he's facing one of the best players in the world. So that doesn't help when your opponent is super strong and has more time on the clock. Yeah, not an easy matchup, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> so Plus, look at that cute profile picture. It all adds up. It all adds up. Yeah, it all adds up in Wesley's favor. I agree. Uh, where else can we go? So many games going on. I'm letting Let's you do the way. Let's see more games from The Sopranos. In this match against the archbishops that is so crucial thomas bartel versus josh bloomer is an interesting position i thought because there are tactical motives with this pawn being on h6 once the white queen is on f6 it's going to be made on g7 so black is doing his best to control the f6 square right so rook d8 played now rook to d6 i think is a good move and the point of rook to d6 is that if you take on d6 i take back my pawn and now I've got a pass pawn with these ideas of getting to g7 with checkmate. So rook d6 feels very natural here. In fact, I Yes, to get into a queen endgame. But maybe what white could do is that he cannot prevent the trade of the rooks, but if he places the rook on d6 and you have to take on d6, he will have a d passed pawn. Right. Right, absolutely. And if black doesn't want to take, then next move could be queen d4 to put pressure on the d8 rook. 
Yeah, no, exactly. So you're going to just pile up pressure on the d file, and there's rook to d6, play queen to d4. Please take me on d6. Give me this pass pawn that's close to promoting. And now queen takes e5 is not even a threat, right? Because if you, let's say I make a move like king to h2, you go queen e5, queen e5, rook e5. Well, that pawn h6 comes in handy not just for queen g7 mates, but for back rank mates in general with rook d8 uh, check Indeed. and mate next move. Yes, these pawns, when, whenever your opponent's pawn or your pawn gets to h6 or h3, if you're playing with the black pieces, or f3, f6, so when there's a fianchetto structure but without the bishop on g7, it's so unpleasant because of the mate threats on the dark squares, but also the back rank, as Robert has highlighted. So it's a double problem. Yeah. So rook c6. That's that to John Urschel, who has just joined us in the chat, and he's requesting some more games from the chess bras. John, are you wearing your chess bra hoodie? If John wants a chess bra game, we definitely are not going to the chess bra game. <laughs> Best friend. Yeah, e6 played. No, that's a good move by Bartel. Okay, so Bartel will very likely win this game. We can go to some chess bra games. Where <laughs> is Eric Hansen? There he is, playing Amit Gassi of the London Lions. And Hansen is down a pawn in this position. His. Oh, that's why you wanted to go there to show John how he can suffer together with the bras. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you just commiserate, right? Misery loves company, they say. But here. Okay, what's going on? E5 was just played attacking this bishop. B7 is hanging. White is up upon at least temporarily. So bishop... <laughs> Greg is saying, hey guys, please don't show any chess bra games. And then he adds, John, this will work because Robert never wants to do what I say. Yeah, too bad I'd already done it. So it's, um, you know... He's wearing the hoodie. Shout out to John for wearing the chess bra hoodie. That's the spirit. How many of you have a chess bra hoodie, because I don't, <laughs> I don't. Eric has promised me a hoodie like a year ago. I don't have one, that's for sure. So it's just John sitting in the corner of his room alone, wearing a chess bra hoodie. <laughs> I'm just waiting to see John's response here. But Bishop takes h4 was played by Hansen. Instead of taking back on h4, so uh, Gossi did not take back on h4 because he probably was worried about Bishop e2 pinning this knight on c4, though. In an endgame like this, white can take on b7 and still be probably slightly better. So instead of taking back on h4, played knight to d6, and now bishop g5 hits this rook on c1, and black should now just be better. Now, the knight d6 looks good, but it doesn't really attack anything. The rook on c1 needs to move, and then c3 is a problem. So here is b6, probably, protecting that b-pawn, and... Black is in the driver's seat. <laughs> John is on a bus going to visit Hugh. That's what he's saying. Wait, is he is he actually? Because I, I mean, <laughs> he is visiting me, but I didn't know. Wait, hold up. Now I get no, out. The best way to let your friend know that he that you should prepare dinner for him and make his bed is by using the Twitch chat. Wait, wait, but I need to verify <laughs> this right now. Oh my God! What? Okay, so sorry everybody. <laughs> Only 1,250 people are watching. Maybe you guys can decide which movie to watch later. Yeah, no, we're, we're going to have a, a good time. But like, the, he, he said he might Sleep over. He said he might take the bus tonight. He didn't say for sure. I never got a text confirming this. So, <laughs> like, you know, probably by the end of the show. Okay, good. He's going to arrive after the show ends. But, like, he might, like, knock on my door during the show, and I'll have to go let him in. So, okay, back to the chess. Whew, glad that's resolved. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> it would have been quite a surprise if he joins you live on air. Oh, he just broke my heart. He's not gonna stay. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was a pajama party. Yep. So, <laughs> better show some chess bar games to be safe. Well, we have Eric Hansen leading this game here. Uh, the king side is very open. Black is just gonna unleash a big attack. Bishop f3. Put something on the h file or get the queen into f5 to h3 and white has two seconds left so this game is pretty much over at this point so i feel confident to go elsewhere and still report on a hansen victory and sure where do we let's go let's move on to another game one of the big clashes in terms of rating average ray robson with the white pieces against pavel Alyanov, almost 2700 once again the rating of the two players and this position Take on d5. Mm, the rook on the seventh rank, it looks very promising, but it's a pawn down. I didn't realize first. Oh, six Although seconds, can... five. 
Wait, he can take now the pawn after capturing on f6. But now, uh, but then. But now black has some counter changes like rook to b. Oh, there's a pawn in f6. I was like, oh, rook b2 attacks f2. Never mind. Rook b2 attacks nothing. Uh, but I guess this rook is coming from e1 to e7. And black needs to start chasing this bishop, I assume. So rook to. Hmm, this is tough. This is really mm -hmm. tough. Maybe rook d4. No time. 17 seconds left for Pavelyan. Rook takes h7 check. Like he blundered. <gasps> they both missed it. They both <gasps> missed it. Removing the guard <gasps> with. I would have won a piece. Oh, they both missed it. So rook b1 was a terrible move. Missed by uh, Robson. And Elianov, of course, didn't see it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have played rook b1. Now black should be better in this endgame. Rook to d8 and start trying to push this b pawn. Rook c8 here. If you take on b5, bishop e4 check, the white king is in big trouble. Same idea with rook to d6. They are both missing the tactical motors with no time on the clock. It's five seconds for Ray Robson. Ooh, he had to go that way. Otherwise, he might have gotten checkmated. So he needs to keep his king safe and sheltered. f5. Okay, that's totally fine move. Just king f6. Makes sense. They trade on g4. And f3 here I play. There it is. So Robson getting out of danger here. No checkmate plans for black anymore. And now it's rook and pawn and bishop against rook, pawn, bishop. Should be a draw with proper play. But missed opportunities for Ray Robson here. Draw agreed. Wow. Wow, what a game with ups and downs. But clearly the, the most critical moment was rook b1, blunder, and white blundering the blunder. Blundering the blunder. I like that. That's a good way to frame that. <laughs> Whew, crazy game. So what's left? Uh, we have Tom Bartell with the white piece against Josh Bloomer, completely winning endgame for Bartell. This game, mm -hmm. oh, the better game to look at, because Bartell just won by resignation, is Sean Rodrigue Lemieux versus Andy Horton, because black has three pawns for a minor piece. And so the question becomes, who actually has better winning chances? Andy Horton, up the minor piece, or Sean Rodrigue Lemieux with a safe king, and three pawns for that knight. And I think white should have the chances here, especially with the queens on the board, because if I can somehow get my knight to e4, so knight f3, knight g5, I'll make knight e5 here to cover g4. Mm -hmm. f6 is a move I want to see happen, because if you play f6, then your king is weaker. So queen d4 is a good move. If you play f6, then queen to d7 check. So black is sort of stuck, at least, for the time being. And so white can just try to, has to maneuver correctly. But g5 is what I'd play now by black, and then... Okay, after g5, you can't lose. Only, honestly, only black can be better now. You get rid of white's last pawn. That was the pawn that defends this knight e5 and keeps it there. So trading on g and f4. Now white, it's impossible to win with the lone knight. Black should not win this game, but you know things. weirder things have happened in the Pro Chess League. <laughs> Anything can happen. Both players are down to 15 seconds. Smooth the Hedgehog declined the draw earlier. Oh, wow. Didn't even notice that. But now it's only black who can win this, unless he flags. But even then, yeah, well, actually, no. There's there's material on the board. Yeah, It's going to be a draw. Soon the knight will take on f5, sacrifice the knight for the two pawns. Yep, knight d7, just go to e5, and then no progress can be made here. At least none that I see. Okay, a draw. Whew, so we can take a little breather and look at the standings here. Sure. What is your take? What's your take? Let me see the updated score. Um, wow, this has changed to quite an extent from how we started out. Yep, and I just pulled up the individual score just so we can see how each player is doing on their respective board. And well, so I see seven points for the archbishops and seven points for the chess press. But things are being updated as those final games from that last round are being input there. Caruana, two out of three. Wesley So, two and a half out of three. And very importantly is Josh Bloomer, one and a half out of three for the archbishops. Mm. They stack the top of their lineup. So even their board yep. three is 2550 fide. And then their board four is like 1900 or so fide and still is performing admirably against some pretty tough competition down there. That is definitely a great performance by Josh Bloomer. Amit Gassi, on the other hand, for the London Lions and zero points, as well as their board one, Sergei Mosesian. Yeah, that's not going to help you win many matches, right? No. So as you can see, for now, it's the Pittsburgh Congrabbers and the London Lions that will be relegated. 
but it's still close with the Miami champions. Luckily for the champions, so far they are doing pretty well yep. in the Battle Royale. So good start for the champions, but we are still far away from the end of today's action. Yep. And you can see that for the playoffs qualification spots, the Sopranos are still missing out on that fourth place that they need to clinch. Yeah, right now they're two games behind the chess bras in today's Battle Royale and half a point behind the windmill. The windmill started with more points, but there must be some bonus for getting fourth place. Or So let's, if you look at the, uh, if I go back to who's doing what here, the windmills are in sixth place, the Sopranos are in seventh. If the Sopranos can keep winning, because they start off half out of four. That's really where their struggles started, right? They had a really terrible first yep. Battle Royale round. And so if they can start winning some games here and jump into, say, third place, by the end of this, they'll get some bonus points that could help them uh, leapfrog these other teams. So I'll, I'll trust Commissioner Greg Shahadi to give out that information. And otherwise... Indeed. So it was 30 points for winning and then, I believe, 25 and so on. But if, if Greg could once again say it in the chat so that I have it copied somewhere because I still had the earlier Battle Royale scoring system. So for this Battle Royale, within the divisions, it's all in the Atlantic Division that we are covering. The next one is all about the Pacific Division. There's even more uh, points up for grab in today's Battle Royale. And this is the last regular season. After today, just a reminder, half of the teams will be gone. You can say goodbye to them for a year at least. Yep. And look at odd skill. Hess and Anna, is it Christmas already? Well, I guess Christmas comes to you twice a week because Anna and I have been doing commentary together quite a bunch. <laughs> And very happily, I might add, at least from my perspective. I know she misses Danny. She's like, oh, Danny's better than Robert. I, I wish he didn't cancel what on me. What are you saying? No, when did I say it's that? It's okay. You didn't have to that say both it. Both of you are French haters. That's the only thing in common. But <laughs> apart from that. <laughs> you actually sound genuinely sad. I didn't mean to you know, make you upset here. No. Oh. I love commentating with both of you for different reasons. But okay. we have a team name, Robana. Robana, yeah. So that's yeah. already. That's already a step up. FIFA with Danny, for fan. I don't think we have a name yet. Mm, yeah, well, let's keep it that way. That way I can feel special. <laughs> uh, all right, so Chess Bros in first. Archbishops in second. Yep. So Archbishops are already safe. The New York Marshals are very safe as well. The Chess Bros looking safer and safer as this match is going on. And, well, the Windmills and Sopranos, those are the teams that we should keep an eye on, as well as the Pawn Grabbers and Champions, because that's relegation territory, but playoffs are of more importance. So let's try to take a peek at Windmills games and Sopranos games. So, uh, Yeah, I agree. So once again, as Greg has pointed out, the scoring system for today, the top team will get 30 points plus all the game points. So 30 points is the extra, apart from the game points. 25 points for the second team. 20 for the third team, 16 for the fourth team, 12 for the next one, then eight, then four, and zero for the eighth team. Yep. And that means that you just got to keep making progress, right? Just got to... <laughs> you see John's chat, by the way? What John is reminding me why I should not be supporting our duo that much. Well, but John, I found a way to make a good use of that emote. You take this emote, and just put next to the Anna Hart cartoon, and that's it, fixed. Love for the French defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. We're not <laughs> buying it here. But I'm also not buying Raven Search's position against the London Lions, Ravi Haria, because well, the Supremes really need to start winning games. And with the black pieces, I like. Well, I don't like his position because I think White can play B4 to gain space on the Queen side, and then follow that with Queen to B3, putting quick pressure on the pawn to D6. So I think White is first here in terms of starting an initiative and that for that reason alone i really like white's chances here but if you don't play b4 and you allow black to kind of safely develop the pieces open up use this open f file or right, semi-open f file it's a good news of your double pawns then black all of a sudden will have good chances for a counterattack. so i really like this move b4 we'll see if white is going to play it in this game mm -hmm. I agree with you. And this game, once again, the Sopranos, they need the qualification spot. The Lions, they need to try to prevent their team from being relegated. For now, it doesn't look that way for any of these teams, but one of the teams will win 
every round it's like a matchup so now every london lion plays against a soprano opponent so board one against board one board two against board two board three against board three and so on yep and actually i saw an interesting game here between robson and evgeny postney where robson has the black mm -hmm. pieces and has an extra queen on the board where postney has a knight and a rook for a queen and a pawn so weird dynamic and i'm going back to see how it happened it looks like yeah, Eric is saying that there was a, a sweet tactical motive by Ray Robson and move 17. Oh, yeah. Rook C1 check. Move 17 there. I Just... need to find the games. I'm a little behind, but I'll be there in a second. Move 17. Sweet tactical motive. Bam. Whoa. Nice. Fork knight. Bam. Eric has, Eric has an emote for that. That's really nice. And so I actually did a bad pawn count. Pawns are even. White has rook and knight for queen. The pawn on d5 is blockaded. I think actually white has great chances to hold this game, but it's going to take a while. It'll take a stubborn defense, and it might help that Ray Robson lost his connection. I see member offline. Right <laughs> Ooh. Now, Not now good that is part of the game. Guys, internet connection is part of the game. It's an online competition, and we did see some of the games in previous weeks that were decided because of a disconnection. Now, Ray Robson not being online is surprising since whenever we had a connection problem, it was normally from a location like Kazakhstan. A player is there in a hotel room. He's not in control of his own home setup. Normally at home, you make sure that you have the best possible internet. Okay, well, he's back. So the internet was sleeping on him like that his teammate was last week. And so it's back, <laughs> everything's okay. Don't have to be too concerned. I'm going to use that emote. I'm going to use that emote. That's still one of the funniest things ever. The guy was just sleeping. I know, and that clip has like 60K views or over that. The last time I saw it, it was about 60K. The clip itself. Yep. Crazy yeah, it's stuff. It's hilarious. I and mean, people love that. So, okay, we'll get back to this game. It'll be a fight to the end. We'll see if he's able to survive, but a good start for Ray Robson. Nice tactical vision. The game between Vasiv Durabeli and Sergei Ehrenberg is one where opposite color bishops, white is up a pawn, because you have, I thought it was even number of pawns, but white's four on three in the king side, and it's two on two. There are double pawns over here for white. Black can make this move pawn to f6 at any moment, trying to get rid of this e5 pawn, and or play h6 and try to get some space for the king. I think black is doing just fine here. And I would not be surprised if Ehrenberg is able to hold a draw with relative ease. Mm -hmm. I agree with Ooh. you. Shall oh. we look at another game from this match? Okay. Where do you want to take us? Uh, let me see which one is exciting from the N same match. Although I'm looking at another match now. Kleinman versus Jura back because I was looking at the King's safety who is doing well here. Whoa. Um, yeah, it's a bit... What has just happened? So White Castle queen side on move 16 and d takes c3 doesn't feel very safe to me not at all and g7's hanging f7's hanging so he took g7 first but something's telling me that the white king is about to get maybe not checkmated but gonna get in trouble so rook takes h1 rook takes h1 maybe even bishop to e5 just continue the attack uh, you know if you take on b2 with the pawn white will play king b1 and use that pawn as an umbrella and say that my king is sheltered. Umbrella. Yes, for now. from Judith's article. I did check it too in New Inches since you mentioned. Yeah, she had a nice umbrella article about it. Yeah. I always called it the shield. That's why I was surprised. But yes, in Judith's article in New Inches, it's the umbrella pawn. Ella. Oh. A, A, A. Yeah, there Thank we go. Thank you, Bing, for subscribing for three months. Yep. Talk about. All right. <laughs> so, Anything to stop us from singing, especially now that I'm still trying to recover from a flu. Oh, you had the flu. I'm sorry to hear that. Flu is never fun. Oh, it's good if you don't see that. I sometimes I need to blow my nose, but I will not complain about it. It happens. Sometimes it happens. This, this season coming, spring is coming and people just sneeze at you on the bus and that's it. I would never sneeze at you on the bus, so just so you know. <laughs> Ooh, tell the, can you please say it to Spanish people who don't, who may not use a tissue or their hands when they sneeze? Well, I, I don't know anybody in particular, but <laughs> if they hear the stream, they know. Please don't sneeze on, on a roof. That sounds not nice. 
But too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> yeah, it's too late. Well, also too late might be this. What's going on with Nicholas Cheka and Amit Gassi? Because something was just taken on c3 here. The bishop on e3 still pins the pawn on c5. So I'm not sure what Nicholas Cheka is thinking about. I would just play rook takes c3, which he finally does after a 37 second think. And the rook can come to d3 next. You're going to have pressure along the d file. You can always pressure on the e3 a7 diagonal, bishop h6 at some moment can be a bit annoying. So here, after queen f6, rook to where? I don't know, Anna. Where should that rook go? Let me catch up with you. So meet Gossi so and So many Nicholas. games that I'm switching from one tab to the other. You guys can also follow any game that you want if you type in slash follow and then hashtag PCL in live chess. So that's the command to see all the games that are currently being played in the Battle Royale. Yep, definitely. And Whisk Mike, I'm just checking your comment there in the chess.com TV chat. No, I am not doing a double shift. Later tonight will be Levy Rosman with Alexander Botez. That'll be a fun duo to watch uh, later tonight, as soon as, you know, pretty much right after we're done with our show. Is it possible that I don't have that game? <laughs> I've clicked on every single Speed, game. Speed Skater and Amit Gassi. Uh, oh, yeah, I found them. I don't know how I didn't see it before. Sorry. Was, it's totally really okay hard. because literally nothing has changed. So my question still stands. Where yeah. should white move that rook? Because I don't know. D B3, D3, C2, C1. I, too many options. Way too many. <laughs> the only thing that he shouldn't do is to try to defend the rook with the queen because that would mean that he blunders the F3 bishop. Exactly. But Blunder alert. I don't think he will fall for that. He's got three and a half minutes left to decide. But he, perhaps it would be a good idea to just make a decision. It may not make such a difference whether the rook goes to b3, d3, c2 or so. But having spent so much time when the opponent has twice the amount, that's not good in a short game. Yeah, and I actually didn't like rook d3 as much now that I'm thinking about it because some moment knight e5 is going to come in hitting this rook on d3 and this bishop on f3. So uh, maybe rook d3 was not the best move here. Uh, but still, I think white is, should be happy with control over a lot of the squares, thanks to the two bishops. And knight e5 right away hits d3 and f3. Sure, but bishop takes c5, hits a7 and f8, and protects d3 and f3 all at the same time. So, um, yeah, it looks like tactically it's okay for white, even allowing knight e5. And if that's the case, then white should be doing more than okay here. I think yes, white is okay because of the tactical reason that you have mentioned with the rooks hanging after bishop takes c5. In that case, Cheka should be doing well in order to win this game, but he has to speed up. So time is part of the game. And in this game, I think it's still possible that there will be a big mistake because of both players running out of time in a position that is sharp it's still a sharp position with that king being vulnerable on this open h file queen f5 now so he's eyeing the h3 square yep so the question is do i protect the h3 square play g4 it will you know do i play king g2 bishop g2 or g4 and maybe, and maybe i can let you go to h3 there's no actual follow-up so really rook to d6 might be yeah. good as well yes it's only a check so far the Black Queen on her own will not do any miracles, so Black would need at least another piece. For instance, the knight coming in with knight d5, knight f3, that would be the only way that there can actually be an attack, a mating attack against the white king. Rook to d6, I like. That's a good square for the rook, putting pressure on the sixth rank and just making sure that Black's pieces can barely be developed. So you see the d7 knight being tied down to the defense of the a7 rook and the b8 knight you would have to do you would have to develop the b8 knight but then the d7 knight is in the air and also you don't have a square for the b8 knight so multiple problems <laughs> about development yeah and that's one of those things where checker can just sit on the position like continuously just saying what is your next move going to be and actually i think it's very difficult to have the black side of this position and so i wouldn't be surprised if amit gossi continues burning his clock as an attempt yeah. to find something by the way thomas bartell with the white pieces against Andy Horton. It's a big win for the Sopranos because that was one of those matchups where Thomas Martell is outrated by Andy Horton, yet still, look at this queen blunder, by the way. So 
Horton was already down a piece, and after D takes E5, took back with the pawn Ow. and lost the Ooh, queen. The end of the game, taking on E5, not seeing the bishop on A3, and that reminds me of my fantasy picks. Andy Horton is my board for choice of the Atlantic Division. We all make mistakes. Yeah, as Greg said, whoever Anna chooses for her fantasy team will do very badly, so every player should be praying that I don't pick them. Yep. It's true. This it's is true. I'm sorry, Andy. I'm sorry. Anna, this, so is, this sorry. is the real reason I don't play in the pro chess leagues. It's not because I love commentating and I love you know, helping people learn and grow in the game. It's because I don't want you to pick me in my on your team because we're <laughs> friends, so I know you'll do it, and then I'll lose all my games. I would definitely choose you, yeah. I'm sorry, you would go zero almost of the weeks, yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, Eric Hansen is being very happy about the chess bars performing so well, leading at the moment. I see a clip from the chess bra channel. Of course, they are broadcasting their match. Eric Hansen dancing and celebrating his good play. He's playing great right now. I have his game up here. And this bishop on c2 is entombed by its own pawns in a great way because b2 could just make use of the pass pawn. Bishop takes d6, simply removes the pawn. There it is, bishop d6. And okay, Hansen now has what? One, two, six pawns against four. So it's a bishop and two pawns against a rook. But very importantly, this pawn on b3 is just one step away from going to b2 and trying to get a new queen. So it looks completely winning for Hansen. His king is actually safe. He's got the pass pawns. The rooks aren't doing anything. So Azarov struggling against Hansen. Who else is in this matchup? That's uh, Sharich has the white pieces yeah. against Miranda. And well, that taking on h5 now with the pawn seems to just give white a uh, clear pass pawn there. Indeed, it's equal material on the board. So you may think oh, it has to be a draw, but no, because the h pass pawn is a super strong pass pawn. It's supported by the h1 rook, the e3 bishop. And how can black even try to block it? The h6 square is under control of white. So age eight will be the square when he, where he can stop the pawn, but that's just too late. The pawn will be very advanced. Yeah, it's already like bishop d4 challenges the bishop on the diagonal. I guess then black will play bishop h6. And that's the one issue for white is your bishop can't control both d4 and e3 at the same time. You'd rather sit it between the squares and then start pushing your h pawn. So here, if you go king d2, I guess black will play bishop to e5 and threaten pawn to f4 and just try to get some counterplay. Uh, perhaps and king to d7 rook to a8 just try to defend actively right like just keep your some flexibility and defend through active means and well sharish has a tough decision ahead of him so we can probably go to a different game for the moment just because mm -hmm. this game between yes kieran, let's move on kieran griffith let's see the rest of the the match between the bras and the marshals yeah i was pulling up the game between kieran griffith mm -hmm and oh, sure. Sean Rodriguez Lemieux. Look at his positions, winning for white because, at least I assume it's winning for white because I think black runs out of moves. So, yeah, let's see, it has to be Tuk Song. So it's a really curious position, the king and pawn in game where you see three white pawns. Those king side pawns should win the game if he plays, okay, how shall he do just it? Let's calculate e a little bit. I think just king e2 because black's only move is either e4 or yeah. king h8. Now if the king h8 play h6, so I stalemate yes. you, you play e4, I take, you play d3, mm -hmm. I take, you play e2, I go g7 check first, then you take my pawn, and then I take your last pawn there, and I'm just up a million pawns and winning this game. So Indeed. So it has to be the way to win. He can go king e2 now, and it's a tuk twang, as Robert said. He gives a check and then takes on e4. So there's no stalemate, and white is winning. Yeah, just going to throw this pawn down to e8, because the king can't stop g8 and e8 at the same time and thus white is just winning here very easy so kieran griffith nice win for the new york marshals you know of course the bras wanted that win but you can't win them all unfortunately so real yes and there's one more board in this match that is michael kleinman versus hamrakulov durabek that doesn't seem that thrilling though so it's a minor piece end game where white has a bishop. He's a pawn down, but he's got the bishop, which is good when the position is about pieces and pawns on both flanks. So you see that the bishop is a long range piece. It is attacking from c8 to b7 pawn and is also defending the g4 pawn. This doesn't happen with knights because the knights just cannot go this fast and they don't have this distance right. of dominating squares. 
Yeah, and you know, in addition to everything you said, which is correct, the b7 pawn can't be defended another time, and if you push the b7 pawn, you lose c6. So it looks like Kleinman is taking Kamrakulov's pawns on the queen side, and then it should just be a pretty straightforward draw. So Ray Robson won again, by the way. He beat he won that game with Rook C1 check, a really nice tactic. Mm -hmm. Sam Copeland, you're there. I know you're there. So Sam, shout out to Sam, who apparently has a very similar fantasy lineup as mine. And that's just very bad news. Sorry, Sam. That's that's really unfortunate for you. Yeah, it seems like having the same lineup as you is means you're gonna stru struggle. struggle. <laughs> it's being equal to like not scoring at all. Yep. All right, so this game is probably going to be a draw. Hansen is, whoa, what's happening here? It looks like Hansen is just winning because if his king can escape the checks, he has a rook on c1, pawn's about to queen. So I, I'm pretty sure he escapes queen a7, king c6, and you're running out of checks very quickly if you are Sergei Azarov. So it looks winning for Hansen again. Very good showing by Hansen. Sharic against Miranda. Looks like Miranda has seen the worst pass him as his king is centralized. If you lose f5, you win h6. That's a decent trade. Here, just king to e6 to protect the f5 pawn, and he took it. I don't know if that was the right move. Well, it's on the board, and we shall see what happens now after white is going to collect both e-pawns. <laughs> Sam with the emote. I just love that emote, Robert on the line. Yeah, I love that. I love that emote. It's, a, it's great. It's very accurate. And it looks like Sharich has taken advantage of Marana's inaccuracy in this endgame because now his king is cut off. And after king takes e5, this f pawn is rolling. Rook f6 check, game over on the spot. And thank you, Jonesboy523. Um, glad to hear that your play has improved. That's really why I do commentate is I uh, really just want everyone to get better I have fun doing it uh, that's part of it but I just definitely like helping people improve their own play so this ending was winning because if he took an f6 this f pawn is rolling king to g7 and I'm getting a queen here for Ivan Sharaj yeah and you guys can definitely learn a lot from Robert so listen to him and not me because all I do is shout free stuff no we definitely want to listen to you I'm gonna see I, I'm usually pretty even keeled here but I'm about to get vocal. Listen to Anna Rudolph. 100% listen to her. Well, Eric is saying that Ilya Nuznik is on four out of four, so we should be we should be checking his games in the next round. I feel like he may be the MVP of the division. Do not listen to Robert, just in brackets. I'm mentioning that as well. But at least so with the white pieces. Ew, is he going down? Where's his rook? Wait, what? Whoa. Where's... He's missing pieces. He's missing pieces from the board. Can he somehow hold this? Probably not, right? Because king c5 back, b6 check, wins a piece. King 7 on b5, b... Oh, look, the king will just attack the pawn from behind here. Which is going to be a... No, no, but... b4? King c5? Oh my gosh, look at this draw. b4, king b5. b3, uh -huh. king b4. b2, knight c4. That way I attack your pawn here first. Instead of allowing, if I did go knight c4 and I went king b3, then you have rook a1 hitting my knight on a5 and threatening a queen on b1. So you have to be very accurate here, and that's why knight to c4, then king to b3, then take, would have held the balance. But after king c6, Ituri Thaga, Ituri Thaga is rightly thinking, look at me, I'm working on that. Yeah, uh, although I'm teaching you the, Sp the Spanish pronunciation, and in South America, they don't actually do the th, so uh, yeah. After all, he may not even say his own name like that. Ituri Saga, I guess he says. Okay, because I know there's many different sort of Spanish pronunciations and dialects, so uh, I'm just following your lead. I trust you on it. So, so Ituri Saga. There we go. Ituri Saga. <laughs> he's, he's on his way to win this, but as Robert pointed out, there are tricks with... Well, not anymore, because the Black King made it to the queen side so earlier on white did have some tricks if he could have eliminated the b pawn but black played very accurately and got there in time to defend the pawn yep and well let's check out elyanov Caruana, the rematch because elyanov defeated fabiano recently and yep. wait what's going on here you're in g5 so you can go rook takes e4 next but rook takes e4 king e4 rook takes g5 
So, yes. Okay, playing for a win is... Six seconds left for Elianov and six also for Fabiano. Two, Two. one. <sighs> wow, I don't know. What... Wait, he blundered a bishop. King takes e4. So Fabiano wins in Elianov's time trouble, it looks like, and he flagged. Wow. Oh, well, yeah, incredible. Both players down to six seconds, and then Elianov just dropped the piece. What were those moves? So King e5, a7, if we just go back to that moment. Yeah, because I was surprised by King e5 on I thought it was going to rook takes e4, king takes e4, and then g2, rook takes g5, g1 equals queen, takes, takes, and make a draw because the bishop covers the a7 square. But instead, Fabiano played for a win with king d e5, and he tricked Elyanov here because Elyanov went a7 and blundered rook d8 check. Instead of a7, he should have rook takes g5 check. After king f4, he had rook f5 check always to keep his king away from the enemy bishop. In fact, white is the one who's better in an endgame like this. But huge win for, for Fabiano here with the winning this bishop on e4. White loses on time, and that's a save. Yeah, it is a save. Um, I just wanted to point out that Mubot, you have a link to the Battle Royale format that has been the previous sessions. So this week's Battle Royale is actually different in terms of the scoring system. There's even more points up for grab. It's 30 points for the first place, 25 for the second, 20 for the third, 16 for the fourth, and so on and so on, plus the game points. So that is why today's Battle Royale is even more important than the previous ones. And those of you who are wondering what are the, the points, how can they have so many points, that's what they have collected so far. Nine weeks of Pro Chess League are behind us. That's how the teams have over 200 points, some of the teams. But what they can collect today, that's the row on the left side. Yep. And so I was just keeping my attention on this game between Gusenov and Movsesyan. And Gusenov had a draw and blundered it. And that's a huge loss that's about to happen for the Sopranos, he just really fumbled this one away in just one or two moves here and just lost on time. But just tragic. Once he got this position with knight e4 check, he walked into this fork with king to e e6. He could have played a move like king to e5, going after this knight, or just king to e7, staying away from it, but went king e6, which still should be okay. But king e5 allowed knight takes f3 with check. Should have went king to e7, and after knight takes f3, played a move knight f4 check winning this pawn on h5. So mm -hmm. uh, mis mistakes come in pairs, they say, and Gusenov made a couple of them and ended up losing a game that he should definitely have secured a draw in. And that's a really unfortunate situation for the Montclair Sopranos as they need every half point they can get. Yes, it is, as Greg said, a disaster of a game. It is, I'm gonna keep checking. I have made a Google search for Current time in Kazakhstan, it's half past four in the morning. It's, whoa, ha, yeah, that's... Pretty... Not for me, for Gusenov, who is right. playing from Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, being at the World Team Championship. Yeah, pretty early, right? Yeah, yeah. late, maybe late, very late, very early, both. Yeah, depends how you see it, right? Um, glass, no, that's not really a glass half empty, glass half full moment, but it's... Yeah. Not fun to play We were that discussing time. this with Robert. So Gusainov is there playing for the team of Azerbaijan. We thought maybe tomorrow he has a free day because as usual with such tournaments, chess Olympiads, World Team Championships, you have an extra player on the lineup. And so one of your players always has a free day. We were discussing maybe Gusainov doesn't play tomorrow in the World Teams. But then we realized that Altai Safarli, who is also on the team of Azerbaijan, he will be playing in the next division of the Battle Royale starting at like 5 a.m., Kazakhstan time. So one of them will be very tired for the actual round of the World Team Championship. Yep. And well, they're kind of out of the placement, right? Like they're, they're not doing so hot over there, I think, in, um, in, in Astana. So I think, I guess, because they might be out of the running, they, not that they don't care, but you know, they, they have other commitments that they're living up to here. And I just want to pull up yeah. the format just to show everybody since I've have a tab of that because I know people have been asking questions. So, sure. Just figuring out, you know, what, everyone can figure it out by looking. It's easier to look and digest. So the, it's a round robin, right? All the board ones are playing the other board ones, board two against board two, etc. And the teams earn one point for every game, typical chest up. But 
they get bonuses depending on their placement. So if you end up in first place, you get 30 points. Second place, 25. Third place, 20, and et cetera, et cetera. So because the um, Sopranos entered today down a bit, so I can, pull, I can pull the standings in a second, they need to finish, let's say, three places ahead of the windmills or the chess pros. That's not looking likely now, but just to remind you, heading into today's action, as you see there in the Atlantic Division, Sopranos are down nine and a half to the chess bras and 11 to the windmills. So if we go back to the format here, they need to outscore them by nine and a half and 11 points respectively. So they need to get second and then have the um, windmills finish in fifth. And that's not looking likely as the games have continued to make progress, but something to definitely keep an eye on. Yeah, that is indeed the situation. There's also cash prizes you can see for first place. So it's 30 points plus the game points plus $500. But here what the team care about is making it to the playoffs. So once again, top four teams make it to the playoffs. Bottom two teams will be relegated and nothing happens to the teams that finish on the fifth and sixth place. They can, they will be in the 2020 Pro Chess League, but they will not see us at the playoffs they will not have a chance to play the finals nor they will be relegated so that's just the, the gray zone nothing happens to those teams yeah sometimes the gray gray area is scary like kind of philosophically <laughs> gray area scares a lot of people but here gray area is much better than the red zone this isn't an, an nfl game so the red zone you want to be there in the nfl yeah. you don't want to be here now because that means you're not making it back to the pro Chessing next season unless you qualify once again so <laughs> let's see right now Cheka, i have his game with the black piece against Ituritaga, but i can go anywhere that you want to take us on i'm totally open to various games i just see that my most loyal followers and dear community are trying to convince greg shahade to get an anna heart mug i don't know how greg could live without an anna heart mug just reminding him who is the biggest Twitter troll in his life. I know. <laughs> so, and Greg actually provides some useful information for a change, saying... <laughs> oh, look, at, look at the other troll. <laughs> <laughs> Almost certainly Montclair is fine if they finish two spots ahead of Montreal <laughs> because they you know, get the extra points in comparison to them. So, okay, that's fair. But right now Montclair is, well, kind of far behind Montreal. They are one and a half points behind, but the chess bras are playing the windmills right now as we speak. And I have Ray Robson's game up against Ivan uh, Sharich. And Sharich with the black pieces played an unorthodox Pierce opening. And well, here he has decent development. The problem is his bishop on g7 stinks. And if he ever plays f5, that leaves open the g5 and e5 dark squares on the king's side. So it looks like to me, at least, that Robson is just better here had decent time management to start the game. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how this game progresses. But right now, I prefer White's position for sure. I also like his position. Sharich hasn't had the best battle royale today. So he's struggling. He has been the MVP for the chess bras. But today, it doesn't seem to be his best day. On the other hand, Eric Hansen, who started with a defeat, his recent games have been way better. And we also saw that his mood is better. He's dancing on the chess bra channel celebrating the good performance of his team and in his in this game against Durai Bali I thought I was going to say I like his position but actually I'm not that sure anymore it's still very early to say they are on move 15 but if black just castles and then pushes f5 I feel like white can end up being too vulnerable so it is White who has more space in the center, but that can be easily attacked with f5. Yeah, right. It looks like this d6 pawn, like this backwards pawn is easy to attack. And g5 is played first. And the point of g5 is play eight, so bishop g3, h6, and then play f5 and try to trap this bishop. And very importantly, the bishop on g7 is unopposed on the board's longest diagonal, or one of the two longest diagonals, I should say. So g5 is a very useful move. You can also put your knight on g6, try to hop into e5. So I would say... I'm in complete agreement with you, Anna, that white is actually in big trouble here. Strategically, 
white's position is falling apart because if I go h6, like I said, then f5, your d5 mm -hmm. pawn will feel weak after that. If you take on f5, I take up with my knight on f5, protecting d6, attacking g3. I really, yeah. really like Vasid Durabelli's position here. I agree with you. So this may be critical for the chess bras. Remember that it's three teams, the windmills, the sopranos and the chess bras. They are fighting for that one spot. Well, not one spot, two spots among these three teams. I didn't phrase it correctly. So one of these teams will be not in the playoffs. And that that's why this match between the windmills and the chess bras has a double importance. If the windmills suddenly win the games against the chess bras, that means that they are doubling down. The bras are not scoring in this round. Right. No, very good point because head to head right now, so the chess bras need to keep winning to keep their fans happy. And here, f5 for Darabelli is really timely. Just go after this e4 pawn, then go after the d5 pawn, use this bishop on g7 here to unleash itself on the b2 pawn. I really like Darabelli. Let's go to Nizhnik, because we talked about how Nizhnik is 4 0. And mm -hmm. the reason why he can yeah. is succeeding so much is he outrates his opponents by a lot on board mm -hmm. three, right? Because board one is yeah. Sharich, board two is Hansen, board three is your 26-26 Ilya Nizhnik. And right now with the white pieces, well, that c6 square is the one that I'm eyeing because if I can play a move like rook to c1 and throw my knight on c6 and you take me, then I'll have a pass pawn there. So I really yeah. like... Nizhnik's position, queen g5 is another move that comes to mind. Trying to get after this e7 pawn. There it is, knight f5 check is a threat on the pin g7, g6 pawn, the king on g7 behind it, mm -hmm. so. Indeed, and that means that Nizhnik is about to move on to five out of five, 100% performance. By the way, shout out to everyone just joining us. We are over 5,552 lovely people from all over the world. You are watching the Pro Chess League. That is an online chess competition of teams from five continents. We have had five different continents in previous seasons. And this is the top online chess competition, eSports at its best. We are at the last week of the regular season. That means that today's matches are crucial in knowing which teams will make it to the playoffs. And you are witnessing the Atlantic Division with Robert Hess. He's a grandmaster. I'm an international master. Those are chess titles. If you are new, if you have never seen a chess stream, please let us know in the chat. And welcome. Welcome to a chess show. Yep. Welcome and enjoy. Because, you know, the best thing I always say about chess and particularly chess commentary is I, I'm a big sports fan, but in sports, you can't predict what's going to happen so well. A team scores, you're like, well, the team will try to score back. That's not very useful. But chess, a game of complete information. I, we can tell you why the moves are happening and what the threat is. So right now, as we we're mm -hmm. discussing, knight f5 is a big threat with a check on the king on g7 and simultaneously an attack on this pawn on e7. So um, black needs to do something about that. If you go king to h8, you're running away for sure. But then rook, maybe rook f to c1. And again, you're trying to plug this knight into the c6 square where it's very advanced and you want black to take you on that square so you can take back with a deep, deep pawn on d5 and then get a pass pawn on the queen side. So things looking very good for Nishnik, who is also 4-0 this far. And for mm -hmm. the chess bras and Kleinman, well, you say, this is not our, a favorable matchup for us. We'll try to get the other games in this match. And <laughs> F5, Eric says in the chat, yeah. It, it is like a knife. That knife is so powerful. It cuts like a knife for sure. Yeah, knife f5. Always fun to hear about the knife kind of slashing through the enemy's position. So let's go back to Hansen versus Durabelli. I mean, I just, the game has been very interesting to this point. And Hansen, all of a sudden, his pieces are looking more active than before. The bishop on g7 is still a monster. Can't deny that. Right, that bishop on the mm -hmm. long diagonal is going to be an issue for white for the rest of the game and does white just go ahead and capture this bishop on g3 right now and say how are you going to take back because if you take back with you can't take back with the knight it's pinned to the king on e1 you can take back with the pawn but then you have a really ugly pawn structure you can take it back with the queen on g3 but then b2 is hanging so every single recapture has some kind of drawback and so i'm not sure how white will pro proceed if black plays knight takes g3 here Instead, it plays bishop b7, so hmm. who cares what I was saying? Because, <laughs> who cares uh, what would have happened after knight takes g3? We will never know. Yeah. But I agree 
with you. That was a critical move. So I guess if I'm Hanson here, I'm casting Queenside. I don't love that idea because you're really putting your king in harm's way. But casting Kingside doesn't look realistic, and he does go ahead and castle Queenside here. So still knight takes g3 is on the table. Leaving Black this castle is also Queenside. Leaving this option open, just saying, I don't need to do this quite yet. Maybe my knight will come to d4 and attack your queen on b3, another option. So I like this dynamic here, tough for both sides. And Hansen, well, I think he's, his position has improved from earlier in the game. Yes, I agree with you that earlier we really liked Black's position, but now it is White who seems to be doing better. Eric points out that the game between Ray Robson and Ivan Sharich has a very interesting position with doubled H pawns for Black. Triple. Also, Black's king is under serious attack. It's a threat of mating one. Queen takes H7 would be mate for White. Luckily, it's Black's turn, so he can try to do something about it. Gives a check on E1, and now on H4 going... He's trying to make a perpetual check. That means in chess that there's constant checks and white cannot prevent it. But in this position, there are plenty of ways to deal with this. So, for instance, now he can move the queen to h3 yep. if he wishes. There it is. So he stops the checks. Yeah, and saying, I'm going to enter a better endgame. If he t trades queens, white has two bishops. And why the two bishops are great in a position like this is this bishop, let's say we take, take. This bishop can go to f4, this bishop is going to try to go to e4 and make use of these diagonals. The bishop on g7, while it's on a good diagonal, there's a problem with this pawn chain simply blunting that bishop, and so it's not really doing much of anything, whereas white's bishops can actually get activated and create problems for Sharich. So I love Ray Robson's endgame here. Yes, very good chance for winning this pair of bishops and those weakened pawns on the h5, as Robert has highlighted earlier. So this is a good round for the windmills against the bras. You see that the windmills have scored 10 points so far, and they are about to get even more points in this crucial match against the chess bras, fighting for the playoff spot. Yes, and Raven Sturt won his game for the Montclair Sopranos. So that was the first game of this round that is finished. But let's look at this game between um, Joshua Grabinski with the black pieces and Sean Rodriguez Lemieux with the white pieces, because it looks like Grabinski is just getting blown off the board here and i don't see how he stops mate because sean rodrigo lemieux's queen is on g5 threatening queen takes g6 check and once queen g6 happens queen g7 will be checkmate so grabinski simply resigns here as the world yep. has no way to stop it as mentioned this this is actually going to be checkmate and one if you take the knight so winning attack for sean rodrigo lemieux and a huge win for the chess bras who are in a heated battle right now it's going down to the wire in this match between the bras and the windmills and it looks like the windmills are gonna get a couple of points from this head-to-head -head match yep Ilya nishnik's way ahead in the clock michael Kleiman has a minute left compared to 745 for nishnik white's position is better white's time management is better white's rating is higher hmm. i mean i just everything is on his side it seems is his profile picture better too? Because that means all in. Mm, hard to say. There's a chessboard in Nishnik's picture, but it's like <laughs> a little far out for me to see. And Kleiman's just a big photo of his face. So I don't know. <laughs> Tough call there. That I'll give about equal. The logos, I'll give the nod to the chess bras and the logo. I just like that a little bit more. Sure. Um, but what I, I mean, I hate Black's position in this game. But F4 certainly comes to mind. Just trying to advance the pawn up here where's the knight even go after f4 actually your 95 is kind of hmm. trapped it is trapped and that's funny because usually you would think that a knight in the center is that's where you want your pieces the center of the board is the most important in chess and any piece that's in the middle of the board usually has more power more squares to jump to or move to but this knight on e5 it is trapped yes it, it ended up being trapped yeah so, like, so f6 would need to be played after f4 to attack uh, the queen and create a square for the knight on f7. But then I go queen h4 and throw my knight, knight f7, or rook c7, and then knight e6 check, and then take... Hey, poor knight! Yeah. Poor knight! It's pretty ugly. It gets ugly real it's fast. It's really ugly. f4 yeah. played. So Kleiman is going down for sure. So queen g4, offering an exchange of queens, but now I would just take on g4. This knight has to come take on g4 and then play rook c7 and say your bishop on b7 is terrible my rook on c7 is fantastic 
this looks amazing for Nishnik. So I think we can safely head away from this game as he's yeah, got Brooks C7 true. played and it's big trouble. Let's go back to Hansen and Durbelli because this game is anything but clear where Durbelli has these bishops that look very menacing. On the other hand, Hansen has a discovery right now with the rook on e1 staring at this black queen on e7. So a move like knight to f6 can be played saying I'm attacking your queen in one turn, but after knight f6, maybe just queen scoots over to f7, protecting this bishop on d5. And in fact, if my, you trade on d5 and my queen gets to d5, then my queen might even run over to a2 and cause some real havoc on white's king, which is over there on the queen side, and a very exposed queen side, I might add. Yeah, totally. So knight f6 is one of the main options here, uh, this, this covered attack, or doing the same from, can he do it from c3 as well, knight to c3? Knight c3. Or, or knight takes c5. I'm just looking at all sorts of knight jumps. Right. Every possible knight jump. No, that's very important. And to just see where can I get the best discovery. But knight takes c5 runs the queen c7, which pins yeah, the knight. Yeah, that's on c5. not recommendable. Nope. And knight c3, I guess, is similar. But after knight, c yeah, I guess knight c3 kind of can lead to the same position. I'll play queen to b7 or mm. f7. You'll take my my bishop, and then my queen takes d5, and once more my queen might come to a2 or something like that with a decent looking attacking chance. Yeah. There are also female players in the Protoss League to answer that question I saw earlier. But in this division today, there aren't any. In the next one and uh, the ones on Thursday, there will be a couple of female players. It is uh, usual to see female players also in the Atlantic division, I would say, yeah. or in general, yeah. in most of the Protest League broadcast, but today we don't have any female players in, in our group. Yeah, most, you know, the top players are playing the World Team Chess Championship. So, uh, Juwen June is busy, for example. She's in the Prague Challenger section. Uh, yeah. Anna Sargisyan for the Armenian Eagles. She's playing for the Armenian national team in Kazakhstan. Oh, there's a checkmate about to happen in Sergei Azarov and Amit Gassi. So, Gassi wins by resignation because oh. King G7 would be played in that game with an F6 check. King h7, rook h8, checkmate. So Gassi with a big upset for the London Lions. And the Marshalls are already safe in terms of qualifying for the uh, playoffs. But they are also been trying to compete for first place. And the chess pros are getting alarmingly close to leapfrogging them for second place. And the big difference, right? What, what's the difference between second and third place? If you're in second place, you get draw odds in a match against the third place team. What does that mean? If you tie 8-8, eight eight, there's 16 games in a typical Pro Chess League week. Mm -hmm. If we tie 8-8, eight eight, the team with the higher seed goes on. So the burden yeah. is on the lower seeded team to actually not just tie the match, but win it. That's exactly what's at line. So it's not just about which teams make it to the playoffs, but also it's much better to finish uh, as a first place team than fourth for the advantage that Robert had mentioned. In the game of Fabiano Caruana, if we can just go there for a moment. Yep, there. Oh, no, he's going to be okay. I was just wondering if there's anything happening in terms of like a potential perpetual, but no, the Wild King has moved away from the checks and Fabiano is an exchange up. Here in this game, what you see if you are new to chess, with the white pieces, he is the world number two in the entire chess universe, Fabiano Caruana, the best American player. He challenged the world champion Magnus Carlsen in November last year in London and almost, almost won the match. It, dep it depended on tiny details whether he would manage to win the classical portion and not have to play the tie breaks against Magnus Carlsen. So you are witnessing one of the brightest minds in the world facing a super grandmaster with the black pieces. That's also a very strong grandmaster, Yevgeny Posny from Israel. Yes, and unfortunately for Posny, uh, he's facing, like you said, the world championship challenger who is here with a vengeance. He lost that game earlier, Caruana did, but now all of a sudden he's starting rook a check and the queen covers the escape score on h7. So the king now has found shelter for white. There's not even a good check here anymore. And if that's the case, then Posny is just going down. And I want to go over the game between Speed Skater and Iturithaga because the Montclair Sopranos are on fire, as someone said in the chat. Uh, I see Greg Shahadi said, whoa, Montclair on fire suddenly. They've won two and a half out of their three games this round. And wow. right here with the black pieces, Cheka is trying to withstand some pressure from Viteri Thaga. But, you know, will he be able to do that? He's playing a strong grandmaster. He's got the black pieces. The e5 pawn is hanging. Uh, it's even material at the moment. But the king on g8 is less safe than the king on g2. The h5 pawn is hanging as well. 
So he takes an e5. Now rook takes c5 will be played by Nicolas Cheka. And after that, well, even material still, watch out for this a3 pawn, right? If black can quickly mm -hmm. go rook c3, rook takes a3, then all of a sudden white could be in some danger. Yes, this is wait. still a difficult wait. end game. Wait, 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 wait. After oh. bishop takes h5, okay, he traded on h5. I thought he going to go g6 and then play rook c3 to keep the bishop on the board. But instead, we got to this position. And sorry, Anna, you were about to say about this endgame. Yeah, uh, I was just going to highlight what you already mentioned that once the a3 pawn drops, this a pawn is dangerous. But it's true that white's going to take on c6 with a check. So if now rook takes a3, rook takes c6 check. And with the two rooks, white should have enough, uh, at least for a draw, if not more. Well, he's going to have more pawns, but the a post pawn is the most advanced post pawn on the board. Right. No, you're right. That looks still looks good for white because even if you go king f6, then I go rook takes d5. Your c6 pawn is sort of pinned because your rook on c3 will be hanging at the end of that. So it looks like here Iturithaga has got the advantage against Nikola Cheka, which is actually one of the reasons I didn't want to trade the bishops on h5. I was clamoring for him to play g6. Rook takes d5 is a free pawn here. So uh, go ahead and yeah, take that. We had a question about the game of Vashli Sova. It ended in a draw. Let's see. So the final moves were a repetition. But what kind of repetition? <laughs> it's so funny. I think, Robert, we need to show it. We normally don't analyze games that have Whoa. finished by their games going on. But this one is a crazy finish. There's rook on c5 hanging, but there's queen e5 check if the rook is taken. Yeah, you can take the rook or you can take, take the rook or take this knight. But either way, queen e5 check is very painful. Note the bishop on c4 covers the g8 square. A queen on the diagonal will cover the remaining squares, and then that black king will be in big trouble. So if you play another move besides queen d8, which was played in the game, and white could have played on, honestly, but I guess it's a very unclear position. But here for black, you can't take on c5, queen e5 check. Then you just go rook f6, and I simply can, well, I can take this bishop, I can take this rook, probably just g takes f6, and big, big trouble for black. So that's why after rook to c5, queen x, not bishop c5, sorry, let me go back, queen e8, and they just repeated moves like this, such that <laughs> the position petered out to a draw. The knight on f5 is pinned to the queen on f4, which is frustrating because if you lose that knight, then all of a sudden black has two minor pieces for the rook. So very weird draw indeed. Yeah. In the match between the bras and the windmills, Ivan Sharich has just gone down against Ray Robson, so that's a point for the windmills, important in this match. But Eric Hansen, he has improved his chances, I feel like, although there's not much material on the board. But his pieces are more active, and he's got an outside pass on the eighth pawn. Yep, so king b5 is definitely tempting. Because once you go king b5, the knight on a5 still protects b3, and then knight c4 yeah. comes with the check. So now all of a sudden... Definitely Durbilly looks like he's in some trouble here. So rook d7 check. Keep kicking this king. Maybe knight c4 is even better than start pushing your a pawn. So that check didn't look so right. But don't take on b3 because then knight d2 check was going to come. So that's why king d3 is played. But a5, king c3. Whoa. Wait, what? a7? <laughs> king c2. Oh. Wait, bishop, now knight b6. Right, knight b6, then king c2. Very Getting very complicated still here. But I, I like knight b6. Knight b6 to threaten to promote and grab the rook makes perfect sense. I don't see a defense there for black. In fact, I really didn't like what black had just done. So rook a8 now makes sense. Play king to, I guess, a3. Now, knight c6 is my pawn to b3 and then pawn to b2. So a7. Why did he not play knight b6 earlier? What is he doing? I, I can't tell you. Eric, Eric, stop dancing and make the best moves on the board as well. Yeah, this is a bad round for the chess bras. They already lost two games, and so they would lose this mini match, two and a half, one and a half to the windmills. And look at this chat discussion in the game of Eric. Two girls saying on chess.com, why I always remember epic fail scenes of Eric on YouTube and Ilya Nizhnik from the Webster Windmills answers, this could be one of them. <laughs> yeah, this was a, um, 
Little Trash epic. talking on point between the the bras and the windmills. Wow, Eric may have just missed the win. Yeah, I think both players are making mistakes. I, I scroll back here to move 54 for a white rook h3 check. And I really do not understand the move bishop to c3 because black should play this king to c2. That way, once knight b6 happens, I'm ready to push my b pawn. And the big difference in the game continuation was with this bishop coming to c3 now as blocking the check. After, rook h2, I don't understand. Knight to b6 instead. Now after um, here, if you play move like king to c2, you're going for the same idea, trying to push this b pawn. The difference, though, is that for a8 equals queen, you got to take this queen, knight takes rook, and if you go b3, trying to push your pawn, I guess it's actually still a draw. King c4, b2, take a bishop with check, just move away, and somehow, some way, black is still holding on. Complicated. Complicated. Maybe it wasn't winning, but the, that was that would have been the only try. It looked... Although, I don't know if Eric was afraid that he was risking anything there. Yeah, it looked close, but I guess it just somehow doesn't win. Maybe King C4 here, but yeah, I don't know. It looked very, very close, but instead we saw a draw by repetition here and a one mini match for the windmills. And it's extremely important now that the Sopranos are also doing better. So the windmills, the Sopranos, and the chess bras, once again, those three teams are fighting for two qualification spots, two. One of these three teams, they are all doing well in the battle royale. So it's gonna be, it's gonna depend on a half a point, probably one missed chance, and that's gonna decide which one of these three teams will not be in the playoffs from next week. Yeah, and Anna, I see in the chat that someone said that Iturithaga blundered in the end game up two pawns. We were looking at it earlier, so I have to go over there, and the pawn got to a two. And Black's King just went down and won this rook. And, well, I guess it was too little too late for White here. And he just actually just started losing all of his pawns. So that was not good news. Ooh, for yeah, the, I didn't see the end of that game. Not good news for the champions who are trying to stave off relegation there. The pawn grabbers are now tied with them in today's Battle Royale. Both have eight points. And great mm -hmm. news for the Sopranos as they jump ahead of the chess bras in today's action. If you look at the standings, now it's a five point deficit. So the Sopranos can um, jump one more spot ahead. If they can leapfrog the windmills, for example, then the chess bras will be in big, big trouble here and yes. may not qualify for the playoffs. It's gonna be so close. And there are two more rounds. Am I correct? I'm, I'm so bad at adding up numbers. Two more rounds, that's correct. Two more rounds, two more oh, rounds. Oh, and Greg says the final round is Montreal versus Montclair. Ooh, the, that's going to be the big one. It's going to depend on that. But yeah, we are two rounds away from knowing which teams will make it to the playoffs. As you can see, four teams will be in for the rest of the Pro Chess League. The gray zone is nothing. They will be back next year, but nothing happens to them this season. And the bottom two teams will be relegated. They will have to try to fight their way back. But the qualification tournaments back to the Pro Chess League are actually really tough. We have seen, for instance, one team that was basically the Olympic team of Poland. Yep. They didn't make it. They couldn't qualify. No, they struggled. And I'm actually looking at the individual board standings here. And Anna, the biggest surprise to me, or actually the most impressive thing, I'm not, okay, but Ilya Nishnik having 5-0, and o, that's great. He's the best player on board three, so not that I expect him to win every single game, but I'm not surprised. But Tom Bartel forfeited that first game and is four out of four since then. So he's the reason why wow. Montclair is surviving because Gadir Gusano is having a really hard time of it on board one. Nicholas Cheka just got that win over Tirithaga on board two, and that was a huge, very necessary win for the Sopranos, and Raven Sturt having an average day on board three, two and a half out of five, but very tough opponents there. So Tom Bartel really leading the charge for the Sopranos. I should have picked him. I've, I have Smooth the Hedgehog, Andrew Horton on my team, my fantasy team I'm talking about. So I'm not winning 20K this week, neither. Is anyone doing very well in fantasy? this week guys let us know in the chat and also those of you who are wondering why are we always wearing the same shirts it's because we are forced to <laughs> no, actually i love this uniform it's one of my favorite uniforms that the logo can't be seen now i need to grow so that it can be seen is it in the 
screen now. I need to be taller so that you guys can see the logo. Yeah, I also need to be taller too, but that's not happening anytime soon. Robert, we need to grow. Well, tell that to 12 year old me, you know, it hasn't happened. So. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, at the Proges League uniform, I was honestly saying that it's one of my favorites because normally uniforms are like, it's a unisex t-shirt. That means that in girl's size, it's like way bigger than what I would need. But this one is actually my size. So I'm very thankful to chess.com for getting a uniform that actually fits. Yeah, mine fits okay. It's no, no problems here. But you know, that's important for you. You just gotta feel comfortable. I want you to be comfortable, confident, happy, all the good things. Thank you. And here's the Battle Royale format. Remember that there's lots of points up for grab and the cash price too, but mainly what the teams care about is whether they will make it to the playoffs. This is the second year when chess.com is organizing the finals as an esports event. It's going to be May the 4th and the 5th. The location is announced already and you will want to be there because it's going to be epic. It's going to be the second time that you see an esports chess event live. So players will be wearing headphones, noise cancelling headphones, playing on their computers, facing each other, and the crowd can cheer, shout, drink a beer, eat some pizza. It's an epic atmosphere. Robert will be there, Alex will be there, Danny will be there, I will be there, you will be there. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> and if you're not there in person, well, you'll be there both in spirit and through Twitch. But yes, of course, well, we want to see definitely faces there in San Francisco. But right now, the chess bras, of course, a lot of fans want to see them eventually make it to the final four of the Pro Chess League. They have a really tough matchup because they're playing the St. Louis Archbishops, led by Fabiano Caruana, second boarded by Wesley So. And that leaves a touch, tough matchup for Eric Hansen and for Ivan Sharic. And Sharic is playing the white side of a French, which means he's completely winning. No, I'm just kidding. In all seriousness, this, <laughs> this line by Caruana is not typical, and it's actually what I played against somebody named Vichyon. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Are you reminding us of something? Can you just repeat it, Robert? I didn't hear it. This, I didn't hear it very well. Vichy. Played it against Vichy. And so queen to oh, d7. Really? Who, who is Vichy? Can you tell us who is he and what was the game? It was the former world champion Vichyon, and Caruana plays oh. this line. And the good news from the black side of this position is oftentimes white are... The players of the white piece aren't so familiar with it because it is an offbeat line. And the point is that now black has a degree of flexibility. The bishop on c8 still isn't very good, but this knight's on e2, and the knight tends to be on f3 in the French. So the white pieces are sort of oddly placed, and black is ready at some point to expand on the king side, maybe with h6, g5, um, things like that. So that's why white has uh, stopped that in advance by playing on to h4. But now bishop d7, castle queen side. And the king is going to the queen side, which is not typical in a French. Black is safe, but black does not have much space to work with. So it's going to be interesting to see how Fabiano continues this. And maybe he'll show some excellent preparation and familiarity with the structure. I'm just seeing the chat and who else is coming to the Proces League finals. Of course, how could I forget to mention the Proces League commissioner, Greg Shahadi, will be there. And my first ever subscriber and main moderator, Benjamin, will be there too. I can't wait to meet one of you. I will not say who. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of them you've already met, so uh, it doesn't count. But I want to give a shout out. 50 to... 50 percent chance, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving a shout out to Steffe, by the way, 94 in the chess.com chat, because Steffe says, Wow, I picked all the top boards today. If St. Louis wins this battle, I'll be leading the fantasy league. So that answers the question. To, Whoa. Yeah, to that. Well, much better than my one. How is it prevented that players don't use calculators? Um, there is an entire fair play division at chess.com making sure that the players aren't using any outside assistance. All players are on camera, so that mm -hmm. is another tool to keep them away from using anything unseemly. And okay, right now Sarich with the white pieces, still better, a bit more space thanks to pawn e5, but as I said before, black has a good degree of flexibility in this position to either play over there on the king side with moves like maybe rook to g8, pawn to h6, pawn to g5, that's a long story, or continue trying to play on the, the queen side, perhaps with moving the king away and playing for pawn to b5 and pawn to b4. So both sides 
and have chances on both sides of the board. I say what black can do, white can just clamp down on the king side and say you're not getting g5 in. And over there on the queen side, at some moment, white can even consider pawn to b4 and then play knight to c1, knight to b3, something like that to gain space there. So very interesting battle. We'll come back to it on that. I think that... There... Yeah, we can come back to this middle game later. I was going to suggest another one in this match is between Josh Bloomer and Sean Rodriguez Lemur. This one, I was curious, what is that king doing on f8? And how did it get there? There must have been a check on h5. Yeah, you think Reed is good, but I think right now it's not so good. <laughs> Bishop h5 check, opening up a pin on this knight on e5. So g6 was going to be played, then knight to f3, exploiting that pin would have been problematic. So instead, after g, uh, Bishop h5 check, instead of g6, king to f8, but this is looking really not good after knight to d4. Knight e6 is a check, hitting the queen, hitting the bishop. I think black is in danger of having to resign soon. Yes, I believe so. It's not good news when you couldn't castle and the position is open. So sometimes it's okay not to castle when the pawn structure is closed. But here you see an open e file. The knight on d4 about to jump to e6, fork knight. Everything is collapsing. Black is lost in just 15 moves. It's, he has played 15 moves with the black pieces. That is tremendously awful news for the chess bros. The good news for them is that they're a bit ahead of the marshals in today's battle royale. So they have a little bit of space there, but if they keep losing games like this, and this is a game they needed to win. Look at the rating differential. Bloomer, 1886 FIDE for the league purposes. Sean Marie Glamue, 2250. Mm. That's a four, almost yeah. a 400 point rating advantage for the bras, but they're losing here. So let's check out the other games, like Michael K versus JJ, J Jamil John, Ali Mirandi. I know there's a C's there, but his name is pronounced like Jamil John with like a J sound. But right now, Michael Kleiman in the slightly better side of this end game that stemmed from the Spanish. Which is very typical, right? Because black has these double pawns here. White has a four on three majority on the king's side. And that should be a slight edge for Kleinman. Thank you so much to Avram42 for the multiple gift subscriptions to our chess.com channel. We appreciate your support a lot. Yeah, no, really, thank you. And shout out to Avram42, as you just said. And also, I see Z Zazvu says, but Bloomer is a nice Blitz online player, isn't he? Yeah, clearly, he's been playing well in the, the Pro Chess League, so he's been performing admirably. And someone said, look at Grabinski. So where is Grabinski's game? Uh, too many games open. Yes, let me help you find it. Found it. it. Mate Schmate. So, I'm going to catch up with you. So Joshua Grabinski with the white pieces against uh, Kyron Griffith from New York Marshals. Yeah, what is And Knight takes e4. So that has been a trade. White pushed e4. Knight takes e4. Knight takes e4. This is the current position. Yep. And what I'd be worried about for Kyron Griffith is if this h pawn goes to h5, it can open up that black king very quickly. But so far, you know, take back on e4 with a pawn, perhaps, and then, you know, h5 isn't devastating quite yet. But, okay, this is windmills looking decent on this board. Ray Robson with the black side in position against uh, Miranda. And knight mm -hmm. to e4 just played, which is a very good move, and I think Ray Robson has a tremendous advantage here as there are some issues. If you go knight takes e4, d e4, bishop takes e4, then pawn takes d4 happens. Now the rook on c8 hits your queen on c2. Your queen needs to stay in line with this bishop on e4, but after queen to d3, then comes knight c5, forking queen, hitting bishop on e4 a second time. So Yes, that's exactly the problem. So bishop takes e4 is played, but the, because of the multiple trades, white is going to be ahead, and he's also ahead in the attack. It's opposite side castling, so this pawn is marching forward. Harry, the h pawn, is going to make it to the fifth rank and open the h file. Yeah, Grabinski is now ready to go for h5. And, you know, on, I, I pulled up Robson's game really quickly, but Robson just looks like he's better against Miranda. So we can go away from these games here for now. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come back because that game with Grabinski will be interesting for sure. Um, I see the game yeah. between Dirk Bailey and Azarov. That game is exciting because I see a knight on f5 and a knight on h5. And Anna, well, I love to attack, so I think I'm very worried about Sergei Azarov's position here. 
Oh, yeah, it's a double danger. Usually I say that when the knight gets to f5, you should already watch out because your king might just be in deep trouble. But now there are two knights on the fifth rank attacking the g7 pawn. And even though there's a bishop on f8 protecting the king so far, the queen is also coming in. He has just played queen to f3. You see the bishop on e3 eyeing the king side 2 and the rook on g1. Lots of attacking pieces with a potential on the king side. So I think there can be a sacrifice soon in this game. Knight h6 check. You said sacrifice. I'm doing it right now. Yeah, let's do that. A knight h6. I love it. Yes. Because if you're king h8. Can you show the idea? Yeah, if you're king h8 and don't take, I win f7. That's a free pawn with my queen on yeah. f3. If free you, stuff. If you do take, I play, can play for, well, multiple ideas, but knight f6 check, king to g7, and queen to f5, threatening to win this pawn on h7, and trying to play. Um, well, there are multiple checkmates. Let's say you go pawn takes c3, then I have g5. I have bishop takes h6 with check, because after king h6, g5 check, king g7, queen takes h7 is mate. So this knight and queen combination on the h7 pawn is going to be devastating. So we'll see if Durbelli is able to find knight h6 check. I think he will. It's not a very difficult move for a player of his caliber to find, and it leads to a very swift checkmating attack. Yes, this is deep trouble for Azarov, and that is problematic for the Marshals. Even though they have their qualification spot already secured, but it's all about which place they will take in the standings. As we have mentioned, the top four teams you see in green will be in the qualification spots, but it matters who is first, second, third, and fourth. Absolutely. So they're okay. The windmills are looking better and better as the games go on. How about the Sopranos this round? We have Gusenov playing against Evgeny Postny, and Evgeny Postny's king is on d2, and he's down a pawn. So it looks like Gusenov, who had one and a half out of five before this round, is heating up at the right moment because I don't know how Postny expects to survive this game. Oof. Like, With that king, I'm not sure he will, he will eventually survive. Um, those of you asking about the players' individual scores, we will show it to you oh, okay. when the games of this round are over. Yeah. So a couple of games more to analyze. And once we have a small break between the rounds, that's when we can show it to you, the updated individual scores as well. For sure. And, well, I can promise you that Gusenov is going to add a point to his score because if he doesn't win this game, <laughs> I don't know what to say. But Knight takes E3 here is very problematic for... Postney, because if you take with the pawn on e3, my rook comes to f1, and I pin your knight on d1, and just keep improving my attacking chances. But if you, I take on e3, take with your knight on e3, then bishop d4 comes, and I've improved the position of my bishop to a protected square. Your rook on g2 is very loose, so you're going to keep uh, an eye on that. The knight on e3 protects it for the moment, but just all sorts of clear attacking chances, and black is up a pawn. So it's looking, re you know, bishop f4. So similarly, good move here. Uh, I'll probably play knight to from f5 to d4 next to improve his knight's positioning. Mm -hmm. It's really not fun to have this position from, from Posting's perspective. No, he moves to b1 with the king, but now with the knight arriving on d4 with the tempo. You see, all the black pieces are extremely active attacking. This is how you want your pieces. So in chess, yes, every piece has their value, but their relative value depends on how well your pieces are placed. And here, all the black pieces have superpowers. They are more valuable than their white counterparts. Part. For instance, if you compare the D1 knight to the D4 knight, I think everyone can understand that the D4 knight is way stronger than the D1 knight, even though they are the same piece. Yep. So rook taking on e3 now. And OK, well, now what? Lots of moves look pretty good, I guess, just knight. Knight f5 is probably good. Ooh, knight f5, I just, I accidentally stumbled into a tactic. I thought I was forcing you to take on f3, but actually if you take on e4, I have knight g3, exploding the, the pit, pinned f pawn on f2, because the queen is hanging. The rook can't take on g3, because the rook, queen on f1 is hanging a different way. So that was an accidental, nice tactical find by me. Very accidental, I just actually- Accidental brilliance, but we just know that Robert is actually alpha zero in person. Mm, no, I'm just zero, like in the movie. <laughs> Tom Bartel wins again with checkmate on the board. This guy checkmate. is unstoppable, frankly. He just, oh, look at that checkmate on a move 28, knight f7 check, spinal tap. Goes, Ooh. 
Ooh, so why did I not pick him for my team? The king has no escape squares, then rook to d8 follows, and well, you got a block, and that's a win for Tom Bartell. So I didn't see the earlier game, but Sam Copeland, Sam, you got to give Tom Bartell some shout outs for MVP, and <laughs> well, this game looks pretty good. So Bartell doing well, speed skater versus Ehrenberg. It's even material, but white looks slightly better thanks to the pawn structure. Although after a move like rook to a4, well, actually rook a4 might not be best. Maybe rook a6, just defend your c6 pawn. Anna, what do you think? Is black just going to be okay for Sergey Ehrenberg here? Uh, let me catch up. I was still looking at the mate. It was beautiful. And I'm regretting not picking Bartel because I had a feeling that I should choose him. Like when you, you know this, when you have an intuition, but you don't listen to your intuition and then you regret it forever. That's what's happening to me right now. But uh, in terms of the position of Ehrenborg, after queen g5, I was looking at the position earlier and the queen trade. This end game, I would say, should be around equal because both players have a, a weakness. Black has a c6 backward weakness, and it's a weak pawn, and white has this b4 pawn that he has to be protecting. Yeah, and the only way to really do something drastic is if somehow white could play h5 and use the h file, but it takes a really long time. You'll lose the b4 pawn in the process. I agree with you. This looks like rook e to c4 can be played, then I take on b4, we trade it on b4, and then I take on c6, and it just looks like a very steady draw. So a speed skater, going to make a draw with Ehrenberg. Raven Sturt with the black pieces against Wonderful Time. That's Tua Minle. And that position is very complicated because black's king looks open, white's king looks open, black's up a pawn. Um, just went defensive with queen d8, trying to go queen to g5 to keep everything protected. Mm -hmm. I like what Raven Sturt just did there. A light, nice swing of the queen from a5 to d8 and then heading over to um, the g5 square. Yes, uh, it is protecting the black king and at the same time he's ready to start his own attack. And after rook c6, a logical follow-up could be uh, queen g5, unless there's something concrete. Or maybe he wants to, yeah, queen f6 to protect the e5 square too. That was my question, my mental question. I couldn't even say it, but he already played it. So now he's going to go rook d8. Just follow that up with uh, trying to trade the queens through a funny manner here. Just attack this queen on d5. So that way, if you rook d8, rook f6, rook d5, rook f7, king, and you lose h4. But that probably actually just... Maybe king g7 then, and black plays rook to b5 and goes up to b3. So actually, black's just better in this endgame as well. So pretty much black is better no matter what. And just to get back to the live position, queen d5 played. And the only reason black is not better is the clock situation. One minute and 30, 36, 35, 34. Counting down. He played rook d8 at long last. So Raven Sturt playing pretty well these last few moves. Well, the Montclair Sopranos need him to score here. And Gusenov... Still playing, still... Still awake. Let me check in once again with the current time in Kazakhstan. It's quarter past five in the morning. It's quarter past five in the morning? Well... Phew. That's for Gusainov, the current time. Well, he might be just throwing away some of his uh, advantage. By the way, Sean Rodrigo Lemieux just won the game. And wasn't that... Didn't we love White's position in this game? How in the world did Black win? Which game is that? Sean Rodrigue Lemieux with the black pieces against Josh Bloomer. Josh Bloomer mm -hmm. was up a minor piece. Like up. Yeah. Oh, I see what happened. After queen to d7, I move 17. White should uh -huh. have taken this knight on g4 first. Mm -hmm. And then try to take on c7. But instead, yeah. he went knight e6, took on... Uh, took on c7 with the knight, and then lost both of his minor pieces, and the knight on a8, I guess, well, still didn't get trapped. So actually, I have no idea what really happened here. It's strange because it felt like he was controlling the whole game, and <laughs> I'm puzzled. I'm, I'm going through the last moves, but clearly when the black queen comes in and the knight on f4, that's trouble already. Yeah, so... he just let white... He let Black do everything that he could possibly ask for, and that yeah. oh, just clicked on the uh, the opening. Always happens by accident, but it, White just was totally for choice. And I guess I moved 26 after Knight of Six. Maybe White should try to get his pieces back in the game with like Knight to A4, trying to go Knight C5 and come after this pawn on D4. But instead, ignored everything, kept his pieces stuck over there 
on the queen side, and well, then the queen came to g3, and it was a very swift attack. So Sean Rodrigue Lemieux helping the chess pros. That was a huge win for them as they huge looked to be comeback in from a game that seemed to be a very bad, probably a lost position earlier for Sean. Whoa, the, uh, the, the that is saying that Eric is in trouble against Wesley. And the Sopranos are right now in the fourth place spot, tied with the, the chess pros. That's how close it is. I don't know what happens yeah. in the event of a tie. So we'll need to figure that out. Greg Shahadi, please let us know if they have the exact same score. Who has the better tie breaks and how? Or do they play a match? Indeed. Yikes. And okay. So right now, Eric Hansen with the black pieces. How many pawns is he down? Three pawns to Wesley So. Yeah, that's a lot against one of the top players in the world. So it's not likely that White is going to blunder his rook. The head to head match. Is that what counts? Yeah, that Montreal wins on a tie break. <sighs> yeah, so wait, so Montreal wins in a tie break? Yes, because of their head to head match. Woo! Okay, well, that is means that Montclair needs to jump ahead of them. And I don't think they'll end up in an exact tie, but right now, Eric Hansen in trouble, down several pawns here, three to be exact. Um, has some outside chances of holding a draw because white's pawns are so weak. Double B pawns, isolated. Double F pawns, isolated. D pawn, isolated. So if I'm white, I'm trying to go rook A1, take A6, take D6. I'm trying to scoop up the remaining pawns and maybe give this king a check in the process to start pushing my pawn on F4. So that's the good news for white is that G3 bishop protects F4, protects F2, but the pawns are really, really ugly. So rook A1 feels like the correct move. I think Wesley will find it. I see that JJ beat Michael Kleinman. We liked Kleinman's position. In fact, oh. Kleinman was winning even in the last position, but he lost on time. You're kidding. Nope. He lost on time. It. I was looking at Fabiano's game. So he just flagged in a winning position here. Ooh, that is really painful in a crucial match. Guys, every point matters. And the chess bras, they cannot afford to lose a game on time in a winning end game. No, and I, I mean, I don't know what's going on in Sharish's game against Caruana. That's a very complicated position as well, where black has one pawn and a knight for <coughs> a rook. But at the same time, white's king looks like it's in trouble. Black's king looks like it's in trouble. So I don't know whose king is safer and why. I think black's king is a little bit safer because c7 is well defended, whereas b2 is not defended very well here. So knight c4 looks very dangerous. Um, yeah, it's very complicated for Caruana. 24 seconds left for him. He plays bishop e5, not trying to give queen e6 with a check, keeping the f5 pawn defended. Queen to b3, king a7. Okay, that looks reasonable. And now what? Queen to b4, offering the queen trade. But then queen comes to g1 and you lose g3. So Apparently the chess bra channel went nuts when that happened, so their player lost on time in a winning endgame, and they are so close to the Sopranos. Uh, Liam Chess is right that in the last round of today's Battle Royale, Montclair and Montreal will be facing each other, but in case of a tie, what matters is that in the regulars, in the regular matches, it was the chess bras that won. Yes. So, if they will have the exact same score after the last round of the Battle Royale, then the Chess Bras will get the qualification spot. Yep. And Sharic can pull off a huge upset here if he's able to knock off Caruana. Uh, Fabiano doesn't have much time left. The position is complicated. But Bishop d3. Oh, Bishop d3 is knight a5. So show that quickly on the board. Knight a5. Queen yeah, takes to sure. queen d5 check, picking up this bishop on d3. So there are tactics at play here. Bishop d3 played, I assume that either knight to d2 or knight to a5. I think knight a5 is better, it's a defensive square. And after queen takes b2, queen d5 check. I'm still not certain if black's escaping here for sure. Because queen f2 check. Okay, so now queen d1 check. Give a lot of checks. I don't think white's king is escaping. <laughs> Give as many checks as you can. Yeah, rook c1 Give runs into knight b3. Then back to d1. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a sort of repetition here. And seven seconds yeah. left, by the way, mm -hmm. for sharp. What is Carwana doing? Queen F2 well, yeah, check. What is he doing? Like he can only play for a draw, but instead he lets White give a check oh, and go. What Queen F4 check? <gasps> no, this is not winning. It's a draw. No, nah, this is a draw. It's a draw. It has to be. Yeah, A5 and then B4. So the king will come this way. Exactly. F5, B4, and they can just agree on a draw. Wow, that was. Whew, 
Wesley so beat Fabian Hansen, by the way. didn't go for the perpetual, and then Sharich gives up the exchange Ooh. he had as extra material. Wow, that was really nerve-wracking. Let's go back to the game between speed skater, that's Nicholas Cheka, because he's winning against Sergey Ehrenberg. I asked you earlier, well, winning might be a little bit strong at the time being, yeah. but it, I mean, it looks winning, because he's going to go win the C6 pawn, and uh -huh. after that, the B pawn is just going to roll down the board. So here, rookie six looks quite good. Because that's a rookie six, I'm just going to win c6. It doesn't go rookie six. Interestingly Shout enough. Shout out to Gotham Chess and welcome everyone who is joining us from Levy's channel. Thank you so much for the late Levy. And of course, we are rooting for your team, the New York Marshals. Currently, we are looking at the Moncler Sopranos match because the Sopranos are taking it. This round has been really a good one for the Sopranos, but... We shall see if White can manage to win this endgame where he's a piece up. Yeah. But they are down to only 13 seconds and... Take that pawn. So well, let's see, do you go king to c5 or does he bring the king back to the pawns? That looks smart. What he did was really smart. He's scooping up f3 and now it's a winning endgame. So that was really good decision making to keep his king. Come take these pawns. Next, play bishop c5. Here it is. Play bishop d4 check. And what now? Bishop anywhere. So he's going to... He needs to think about this a little bit, just so he doesn't allow this king to come to. Yes. What is? All right, so he's going. He's going to move his bishop back and forth, then move his king up to go win this pawn, I guess. Indeed. So White will want to get the c6 pawn with his king, and then he can even sacrifice the bishop for the f pawn if needed. Right. And very importantly, this pawn on b4 is not a pawn a4. So if that pawn was an a4, it would be a draw, wrong color corner. So now it's easy, king so takes important. king yeah, f3, bishop c5, and then it's easy. So I keep my pawn protected, king e5, king e6, game over. Don't stalemate. King e6, don't take on c6. No stalemate, don't stalemate. <sighs> Ooh, it was close. It was close, but of course we are witnessing two grandmasters facing each other, and no, he didn't step into the stalemate. That was really close there. So that's a really bad news for the pawn grappers, as they're about to get relegated unless... They somehow win a bunch of games and take over the champions. On the other hand, the Sopranos have made a tremendous push, thanks in large part to Tom Bartell. I'm going to pull up the, yeah. the standings the here. The individual scores. Man, my butt hurts from sitting in the seat and just like from squirming from the excitement. I'm not, I can't <laughs> lie to you, Anna. Like, I'm like talking a lot, but also like shifting a little bit. And I, I don't know what to make of this. Anna. So we're looking at the scoreboard here, okay? We are looking at the scoreboard. Guys, this is it. One more round and it's over. This is the last week of the regular season. Half of the teams will be gone by the end of today. The Atlantic Division, this is the one we are covering. One more round and that's it. Four teams will make it to the playoffs and the rest, adios, goodbye. That's how, that's how you learn it in Spanish, adios. That's what we're going to say to the teams. Those of you who are just joining us, this is the Protoss League, an online chess competition, eSports event, and it's so close. It's so close. Robert, take us through the standings and what can happen now in the last round. Okay, so right now, as we see on the, you know, next to my face, not you. Anna's the better part of looking next to my face on the screen, but if we look the other way, you see and that... the pug. I thought you were talking about the pug. The, well, the pug is also very cute. I don't know if the pug's name is Anna, but, you know, cute pug there. doesn't on the have a name yet. We will, we will need to give him a name at some point. But if we look at the standings, right? So St. Louis is safe. New York Marshalls, safe. Webster Windmills, hmm, very close here. Montclair Sopranos, in right now because they've leapfrogged the Montreal Chess Bras. Yep. The Chess Bras play the Sopranos head-to-head. -head. And if... The Chess Bros defeat the Sopranos. Let's see. Actually, I'm going to try to figure out exactly what needs to happen because if we pull up this scoreboard here, the Chess Bros have 12 and a half today. The Sopranos have 15. So even if the Chess Bros, the Chess Bros might have to win three and a half to half. Is that right? Like they win three and a half to half, they win 16 to 15 and a half. So to leapfrog the Sopranos back. Wow, this is. I mean. I don't know, this is so close. I think I'm going to rely on Greg Shahadi to sort of give all the information, but I'm going to pull up the individual scoreboard once more, and Anna, Tom Bartel is the hero of the day, in my opinion. He is five out of five in games he's played. He lost his first game by forfeit, and his board one is struggling, Gadir Gusenov. Nicholas Cheka, 
also an MVP candidate, four and a half out of five on board two, pulled off a crazy upset against Eduardo Iterithaga, and then also beat Sergey Ehrenberg. And Raven Sturt, three and a half out of six, a very respectable score for him. And he just won that game over wonderful time. That is Tuan Min Lee. And, I mean, these guys are just, they came back from what seemed like the dead after a half out of four start to the match. So, Anna? And it's impressive. And what Greg is saying is that the Chess Bros will probably be fine if they finish two spots ahead of the Sopranos. Is that what I read? Let me just scroll back because it has moved. The chat has... The chat is moving now so quickly that I missed the comment exactly. So is it? Uh, so like in Montreal win two and a half, one and a half. There's a good chance it's enough for Montreal. Why? Three one almost definitely enough. Wait, why is that? Because if we look at the scoreboard, if Montreal beats the Spurs two and a half to half, they're still going to be in fourth place. And Pittsburgh survives with a win, uh, three to one over Miami. He believes. So they need to avoid finishing two spots below, is what Greg is saying. But even if Chess two, two spots below, sorry, I, I no. completely said the opposite. He's, oh, because Montclair won't get first place. Montclair has extra bonus points. So they're tied for St. Louis for first. That makes a lot more sense. Hmm. And let me pull up the format really quickly, just because that will help all of us. The format for yeah. this Battle Royale, you get one point for every. So they had 15 points, which means they're tied for first and second. Between first and second, they get 27 and a half. Uh, bonus points plus the 15 points that they have right now. So that's a heck of a lot of points. But yeah. if Montclair is a slip up and St. Louis is to go forward and win this event, then they might slip out of first, a tie for first, maybe even slip down to third place. And if that's the case, the extra points, four points difference is not enough because they entered, I'll pull up the standings really quick. They entered today's action down nine and a half to the chess bras, down 11 to the windmills. So if we go back and forth between the standings here, we're down nine and 11 and a half, and we look at the difference between fourth and second, that's nine points plus the difference in their score on the battle royale. But if it's second to third or third to fourth, that's four points plus that difference. It's not enough to make up the, all the ground that they were behind. So it's getting complicated. My head hurts just thinking about it, Anna, but... I'm just like, how, how many is like one plus one at this point? I'm like, it's still totally blacking out in terms of numbers. It's still two, just for the record. One plus one is still two. <laughs> Thank you. I, I wasn't sure. I... Honestly, where's John Urshel when we need him? Isn't he knocking on your door yet? Uh, on a bus, I guess. That's what he, you know, he <laughs> How long does it take to get to your place from his place? From, it takes a while. Those bus, especially with traffic, um, definitely a long while, up to like five hours, probably. Oh, we have action though. The last round. This is it. The last round. Eight teams started today's Atlantic Division. Half of them will be gone after this last game. Decisive last round. Yeah, we're going to keep pretty much all of our attention on the chess bras against the Sopranos because, well, that's the game for the final playoff spot here. And we see that right now, Gadir Gusenov is white against Ivan Sharich, and they're playing this sort of offbeat close to something that I have a lot of experience from the white side. The bishop will come to d3 now, and it looks weird because you're blocking in your bishop on c1, but white is ready to take this knight on d4 and then move this knight to e2, which is why black played knight c6 back. And here, white can play as in the game with a3 and potentially try to push this b pawn or play rook to e1, bishop to f1, try to go for pawn d4, more traditional setup in the center. Anna, I, I, I'm nervous, honestly. You're nervous? Yeah. Current time in Kazakhstan. <laughs> it's, uh, what, 5.30 in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> How did you know? So, well, you've been telling me what the time has been. I just realized it's two hours before. It's 10 hours, essentially, ahead of New York, so. I, I see that. You're almost as good at math as John Urschel. That's close. It's a toss-up. You know, on <laughs> probably Tuesday through Thursday, I'm better at math. And then from Friday through Monday, it's him. So, you know, like I said, it depends on the day of the week. Sure. Let's see the other openings and which game will be the most heated up. You guys know that the openings, well, these players are so strong. Normally, theory, nothing extraordinary happens because usually they are balanced positions. But I'm curious which opening will lead to the sharpest position. 
well, in this final round. Hansen's king is on f2, but it's not. that doesn't mean the position is sharp. So he put the king on f2 because realistically, he didn't really want to castle kingside, especially if you ever take this bishop on g6, that'll open up the h-file. So by putting the king on f2, you sort of delay the setup here. The bishop on f1 can go to e2, can go to g2. You get to choose where exactly you're putting that piece. But black is very, very solid in this position. Even if you give up your bishop on the light squares, no clear weaknesses to speak about. So black tends to enjoy that kind of solid structure. And that means that a lot of work will have to be done by Eric Hansen to secure a legitimate advantage. On board three, Raven Sturt, Michael Kleinman. Uh, Kleinman looks fine in the early going, a little bit less space, but Sturt going for the London system and a very safe system at that. Yes, and on the last board, Thomas Basil with the black pieces against Sean Rodrigue Lemur. I'm, I think I keep mispronouncing it. I wish my French pronunciation was better because Lemur must be a French. And you surname. love the French. I love the French, but I still can't speak French. I know it's, it's just terrible. How can I not learn that language? Anyway, I love French as a language, but I can't speak it. His name is Sean with the white pieces, and he has just played h3. The position, I like white so far because he has finished his development. You see that he has managed to castle. He has activated all his pieces. And the black king is still in the middle of the board. The e file is not open, luckily for black, but we still yet to see if black's gonna castle kingside or what is his idea about the king situation? Yeah, because you can choose. You can play a move like knight a5 and just delay the castle, or you can castle right away. And I would say the one thing I'm worried about when I castle kingside in a position like this is let's say I castle, knight e5 happens. Let's just play some quick moves. Rook e5, knight d7, rook e3. At some point, if like h4, h5 comes in, over there on the king side, I am worried about white flipping over to the king side with his rook on the third rank, trying to start attacking some of these open lines. But that's a very long idea, and it takes a bit of time. And here's 95. So you might, in fact, see this kind of structure happen. Um, and if that's the case, Bartel will have some defensive work to make sure he's not too worse here. And took with the bishop on e5, that looks fine. But queen c6, followed by rook to c8. Rook F to C8, that is, followed by pawn to B5. That looks like you're getting the counterplay you need on the queen side. In the game of Gusainov, so that is the board one clash between the Sopranos and the Bras, I think Gusainov has improved his position to a great extent with Whoa. queen G4 provoking a weakness on the king side and now stopping black from castling with bishop H6. Yeah, this is just nice because queen G4, you said castle doesn't work, bishop H6. You are getting checkmated, so you have to push your pawn, but then you lose your rook on f8. So instead of castling, which loses material, went g6, and after bishop h6, as you point out, well, you're certainly not castling now. After bishop f8, you take, you know, queen at g5 or something, like queen h4. Queen somewhere in the dark squares, or not. Why h4? Somebody explain that move to me. <laughs> Can you explain that move to me, Anna? No. Okay. And now h5. Well, now g6 is hanging. And rook e3 to g3 is actually going to be an annoying threat. So maybe okay, it makes, that makes sense. Can black play f5? f5. Wow. Yeah, because there's a pin. So uh, what Robert is showing us that white cannot take on f6. e takes f6. f5, e takes f6. That's a legal move in chess. Right. It's called... En passant, there you I are with your French. <laughs> Look at your French. So yeah, you can take when your pawn's on the fifth, your fifth rank, and a pawn moves the pawn for the first time two squares. You can take en passant, but here you lose your queen, so you can, but you shouldn't. And you shouldn't because you drop your queen. So don't show, don't show off with your yeah, I know how to en passant skills when the queen is in the air. Yep, and well, the queen right now. C7, F4 situation, still interesting. I mean, rook E3 or pawn to A4. Just play on both sides of the board. And that's why I like Kristanov's chances so much. He's up two minutes on the clock. Rook E3 at some moment is going to be annoying. He plays A4 first, which is probably better, frankly, uh, because now B5 is under attack. If you take on A4, then I take back with, well, either piece, and your A6 pawn is very vulnerable. So looking really, really nice for Gadir Kristanov, who's had a tough go of things so far in the Battle Royale, but if he can win this game against Ivan Sharich, the nearly 2,700 rated player, 
That's tremendously awful news for the chess bras. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure that his team will be proud of him, the team of Azerbaijan, even if he may not win his game tomorrow at the World Team Championship. So rookie three played by Gusenov. We'll come back to this one, but Gusenov picking up steam here. F5 doesn't make as much sense now because, yes, you're still taking advantage of the uh, pin pawn on E5, but maybe my rook is ready to swing you G3, pressurize this pawn on G6. I mean, I still might play F5. And there it is. F5 played by Ivan Sharic. Yep. A very good it's defensive move. It's on the board. Avram42, thank you so much for your continuous support gifting. Yet another sub. You have gifted already 22 subs to the channel. That is really nice of you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And on, I'm flipping over to Tom Bartel's game because we talked earlier, at least I mentioned earlier, how white may be able to start an attack. Well, black is clearly way first to this attack as the queen side is now opening up. Black's king is much safer than white's is even because this pawn structure, e6, f6, g6, f7, that's a fortress. That's like a moat in front of a castle there. You're not it passing that. It does look that. like one, yes. I mean, black is doing tremendously well here too. I keep using the word tremendous because I don't know, I'm so like hyper about what's going on here. Usually I'm very calm, <laughs> but right now it's like, this is the end of the season. Yeah, we should be all super hyped about this. Poggers, can we get some poggers and hype in the chat? Peter Poggers. Peter Poggers. Poggers by now on my channel. It should be Poggers. I'm getting hyped right now. I see everybody <laughs> in the both chat rooms. Whew, I'm going to take a breath real quick here. Pure quick. Um, so poggers. I need some Poggers emote in the chat, guys. Poggers or Peter Poggers? You can use our very own producer, Peter Poggers, if you feel like. You can also show some love to the new emote on Chess.com's channel, but it's definitely not a zzz moment. Not even in the slightest. You're rook to d8, go after that d4 pawn. If you play rook to d1, then white, excuse me, black plays pawn to b3 and goes right after d4. So this looks like black is going up a pawn. Tom Bartell is the hero of today. Like, even if the Sopranos do not make the playoff. He forfeited his first game. He's won five straight, and he's well yeah. on his way to getting the sixth straight. I mean, this is MVP. a very good position. For Total him. MVP. Oh, look at that Poggers emote on Sam's channel. I love it. Shout out to Sam Copeland and that amazing emote. I didn't see that before. That's Have hilarious. you seen Sam's emote for Poggers? All right. So. Oh, that's lovely. Back to Hanson. Okay, Hanson is. Is he better? Is he worse? Probably slightly, slightly better for Hansen. But Nicholas Cheka showing good understanding of this position to take control of the C file, say, yes, white has the two bishops, but how are you going to expand? Rook C, 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 Rook C, one of those squares to double up my rooks. That's immediately what I would do. Rook C6 played. Looks pretty good. Yeah, hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that Hansen is winning this game. In fact, that. Don't really see how he's making progress. Here. I would bet on a draw. This one seems solid. Very, very solid. The, what can you do? Can you knight a4? That's actually a thematic move to make. Because if you take on c2, bishop c2, and take on a4, then I get this open b file. So I give up the... I compromise my pawn structure for an open file. So that's what happens when you get double pawns, right? Something opens up. So knight e2 played instead. Traded. Rook to c8. Bishop d3 back. Now what? Knight... Maybe king f8 or knight bd7. Black can start playing for more. Knight bd7 followed by e5. Looks tempting. Yeah, this bishop on e3 really annoying. So Hansen, not in the best shape right now. Board three we haven't looked at. Raven Sturt, Michael Kleiman. That game, I think it's heating up with the knight on f4, the queen on f6. So black is putting pressure on the king side. At the same time, the queen side is opening up and the a6 pawn is a target. You see that white has two pawns on the queen side versus one. Yep. And he is now attacking the bishop. And later, the a6 pawn is really vulnerable. Plus, the d6 pawn, that's a backward pawn as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So what Sturt is trying to do is search d5. Whoa, what if I just take it? What's happening here? e takes d5. Or do I go... Hmm. So ed5, bishop d5, knight e4 is what was tempting me. But I'm not sure if this is working out or not. It looks pretty good. Because by knight e4, I'm attacking your queen... I'm attacking your bishop on d5. All right, so moves are being played, so I'll get off the 
highlight boards. A queen to c3 was played instead. That looks a little bit passive for my taste, but still, that knight's coming to e4 next move or to c4. And black is either doing very well because I knight on f4, or some pawns are starting to be threatened a6, e5. I do like white's position here, Anna. I don't know about you. Yeah, me too. With this pressure on the e5 pawn and the a6 pawn still being a target, it's very likely that soon white is going to be able to create either win a pawn or create a pass pawn on the queen side or both. And that's just good news. That will mean that black's attack, the, the attack he was trying to build on the king side, is not going anywhere and white is going to prevail on the queen side. Yes. And I'm going to flip us back to Gusenov's game because Gusenov now has an attack brewing on the king's side. The g6 pawn is definitely under attack right now with the queen and the rook. Now rook f6 comes to put a third attacker on that very g6 pawn. And I think the way to win this game is after rook f6, king h7, play f4, play f5, cut the queen off from the g6 square, and then win this g6 pawn and smash open black's position. I think this is actually completely winning for Gudir Gusenov, who has struggled to this point in the battle royale format it's incredible he has struggled and it's gonna be 6 a.m for him he has been up the whole night in kazakhstan playing for his team that's dedication guys that's dedication but he wins when it's needed the most the chess bras and the sopranos are the biggest rivals for that qualification spot and this is the all decisive match between the two teams <sighs> yeah and it's really I mean, it's hard to even figure out which game to stay on. I mean, Tom Bartel's game, now that I go there against Sean Rodrigue Lemieux, um, right here, Black's up a pawn. The G3 pawn's falling down. So what does Black do here? Does he play King H3 to say, you can't take my bishop because there's back rank checkmates? I think that's... Yeah. I mean, bishop E3 is a good hey. move. Yeah, I like it too. Anna, I think there's King H3 now. How are you going to stop the mate? Oop, sorry, I clicked on... You can't stop Rook A1 checkmate. It's over. Tom Bartel is a hero. He is a hero. So he lost his first game because of not being here. And ever since, he kept on winning and winning and winning. I don't know how he does it and why is he not on my fantasy team. There's no question to me. that There's not even another MVP candidate. It's completely Tom Bartel. He's changed the entire dynamic of this battle royale. Started with a forfeit game winning six straight to lead the Sopranos into the playoffs. So, I mean, he won that wow. game there. So that is a humongous win. And let's see the other games right now. Gusenov played Rook F6, King H7. He needs to find F4, F5, cutting off this bishop. Excuse me, the queen. The queen's acting like a bishop here. But cutting off the queen from the defense of G6. F4, F5, black cannot stop it. And then once I play for F4 and F5, I'm going to take on G6 and mate the black king. Very forcing stuff. So what's going to happen if, after Tom Bartel's win, in, in this one, Gadir Gusainov is winning too for the Sopranos, and on the other two boards, what's the situation? Let's check it out. Hansen versus Speed Skater. Um, Hansen has... Has he made progress? Not especially. He's pushed his pawn up to e5, which leaves d4 a little bit vulnerable. And after this bishop b4 move, well, the bishops are threatening to be traded, Black can play king d7 next just to make more room for the bishop to retreat to. And I don't see any weaknesses in the position. That said, white will try to go g4, king f2, rook h1, h5, something like that to play on the, the king side. But the c file is still vulnerable, so you can always put a knight on b4 if you want. So Cheka holding on here against Hansen. Gusenov still thinking against Sharich. Raven Sturt with the white pieces against Michael Kleinman. This is anybody's game. This is the this is the one real toss up here because it's very unclear with the queen and bishop aiming at g2, the knight on f4 threatening some sacrifices at the right moment, pressure for both players on both sides of the board. Anna, I, I, who do you like here? As you said, anything can happen. Three possible results. It's all wide open. The two players are getting really low on the clock. Two minutes for white. Three and a half for black. And the position really, I think there's going to be a mistake. One of them will blunder. That's my prediction. Okay. And who is it easier to blunder as? It's probably easier to blunder as white here. So I would lean towards Kleinman if I'm expecting a blunder. But uh, because his queen is very active and seemingly menacing. Rook takes c1 ideas with knight to e2. Okay, rook to d1 was played. But knight to, no, knight d3 doesn't work out. 
Hey, queen d3, trying to offer an exchange of queens. It looks like black has been picking up some of the momentum in the position, and I, um, I definitely respect that. But let's see. Gusanov went f4. So Sam Copeland, I know you're always listening, but Sam, if he plays f4 and f5. A M Sam Copeland. Queen, so f5 here or queen f3? Because queen f3 threatens mate with rook takes h5 check. Uh, I think f5 is the way to go. Because after f5, you have to take with e pawn if you're going to take there. And then I play queen f3 going for the mate on h5. And after king h8, then I have rook takes g6 check, followed up with queen takes h5 check, and it's really a forcing knockout punch. So Gusenov, if he pulls this off, and it looks like he might, he's just going for a very straightforward, just crushing, brutal attack here. <sighs> I'm having trouble even breathing right now. I know, this is insane. 6 a.m. in Kazakhstan. The guy is playing for his national team at the World Team Championships, mm -hmm. but he's so dedicated to the Sopranos that he's here, not sleeping the whole night, just so that he can play this last game against Ivan Sharic. The point that they badly need, the Sopranos wanting the qualification spot, taking it away from the Montreal Chess Bros. This is what's happening right now. Yeah, and he went Queen E3, which I don't understand because Queen F3 looked more direct king h8 was played and now now queen f3 back i guess but it feels like that was a missed opportunity and sharich is slightly better chances than he did a moment ago i don't really know why queen e3 was played I, I could tell he tried to get his queen to the h6 square somehow but it's like if my opponent doesn't see it i'll be able to get that attack said he was king h8 that way he can always block a check with rook to h7 so Sharich fighting back is now up on the clock. Not a clear position here. It's still better for White. Let's go to Hansen game because Hansen all of a sudden is all in on the king side where Cheka is all in on the queen side. Oh, Raven Sturt, wow. Raven Sturt up a piece. So clarified. Oh, we were talking about blunders <laughs> and things like that. Do that one. Uh, yeah, this is well, unless there's going to be a blunder, it is just. A simple win for Raven's Turk. <sighs> Up a piece here. It is 3-0. That's how it's looking so far. 3-0 in favor of the Sopranos. Only Eric can save the match, but that doesn't matter. Although Greg said, didn't he say, oh no, they should have 1-3-1. I'm so confused by the numbers. But no, it's that, that's it. The chess bras are going down. They're... And the windmills, how are they doing in this final round? Yeah, let's take a peek over there. So the windmills, where are they? I see that Ilya Nizhnik won his game. Whoa, that's a checkmate on the board. So it looks like Nizhnik got fancy here with his knight. And one knight gave a check. Second knight gave a check on wow. E7. Sam Copeland, you know what to do. Bring that up in your potential game of the day booklet. Dura Bailey is with the black pieces here. He has the pass pawn of the position better for him for sure. Ray Robson with the white pieces against Sergei Movsesyan is down a pawn with the white pieces is Robson, but has clear compensation in the form of two bishops, particularly this bishop on g2. <sighs> Breathe. And Andy Horton <laughs> versus Gab Grabinski. Well, Horton is in big trouble against Grabinski because that pawn on d3 is menacing. King f3, king e2 looks like trouble. a3 is hanging, f2 will be hanging. So poor Mr. Horton. You chose him for your fantasy team, so of course. I chose him. I chose him. I'm sorry, Andy. It's all, it's all my fault. It is all your fault. Nobody's going to forgive you, ever. Oh, definitely not the Chess Bros, because the windmills are winning, the Sopranos are winning, and that means that the Chess Bros will not make it to the playoffs. Yeah, and Wesley So is in trouble against Sergei Azarov. Simply down in exchange here, David Pruis in the chat pointing me to that game. Thank you, David. Right now, it looks like Wesley is just in big trouble. He's 38 seconds and down material. But let's go back to this Gusenov game because it looks like Sharich is trying to fight his way out of this. And in fact, I think he has. We have to rook to a8. He can now play queen to b1 perhaps and try to play rook a1 next. And here it comes. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ca some counterplay. How did this happen? We thought that Gusenov was about to give mate. This could turn around really quickly. Raven Sturt still winning. Let's check out. If so, Raven Sturt wins, Gusenov just needs a draw. So if I'm the Sopranos I'm, and the manager, I'm like letting you know the match situation. You only need to draw, buddy. Don't go all out here because Raven Sturt is still simply up a piece and about yeah. to flag his opponent. 
Nick, Nicholas Cheka with the black pieces against Eric Hansen is also just one upon and should be, I don't know if winning is too strong, but should be on the path to victory as Hansen only has 25 seconds. And good news for Sopranos fans all around the world right now. Gusenov has been shuffling pieces here. Rook to E1 looks good. Black cannot get active counterplay with his Rook stuck on G7. So Gusenov, just make sure you don't blunder anything on the second rank or anything like that. Like, you know, Rook A2, Queen B2 trying to mate you. Just protect your king side. Play Queen E3 to G3. That's what he's doing. And uh, he'll be okay. So So Greg is saying that if if the chess bras manage to make a 2-2 in this match, they still have a chance if Webster and St. Louis pass Montclair. Well, they're not going to get 2-2 because Raven Surge is 1. That's 2-0 in favor of the Sopranos. Eric Hansen just has no way to win this game. He's down two pawns right now, and his position is bad. So if he wins this, that's just an incredibly fortunate situation. Or like, you know, King to E7, for example, just stopping this rook from infiltrating via F7. That seems to shut down pretty much all of White's counterplay here. And he went knight E3, which says, okay, take my knight on E3. That way I get your Dark Sword Bishop off the board. Once that's off the board, D4 is going to be a weakness. So they're still clear fight. Okay, now take on G4 and then Rook B2. Yeah. That's just winning for Cheka. Rook B2. Indeed, that pin. And now White has to go Rook G2. Oh, oh he just gives up the Knight with a check. What was that? He's, what was that about? He knew that if he went Rook to G2, then he would have lost the H pawn because it was on H4. So instead, he's just hoping mm. to try to win, make a win out of nothing here. But the Gusenov game, both players also have nine seconds left, and Gusenov is better in this end game with the king active. Let's go back to speed skater. Nikos Cheka just winning. Rook g5 check next, forcing the rooks out the board. Hansen resigns. It, that's it. Nikolas Cheka beats Eric Hansen, the captain of the chess brass, goes down in this crucial match. Also, Ravens start one for the Sopranos against Michael Kleinman. And we already mentioned the first game to finish was the one between Sean uh, Rodrigo Lemel and Thomas Bartel with a win for Bartel. Wow. Yeah, like it really is just painful last round for the chess bras who started off on such a good note. Gusenov holds the draw here as well. So I think the Montclair Supremes will tie for first in this battle royale with the St. Louis Archbishops and Perhaps that even leads them ahead of the New York Marshals in the standings, and they could jump perhaps even to second or third place. So we'll see what's going on here. Still, obviously, plenty to figure out as the games are continuing, but we see that Charge Drew, Kevin Carl is losing for the pawn grabbers against the champions, which means that Miami is going to survive and stay in the league, and the pawn grabbers are getting relegated not good news for them. Ray Robson here. Well, Ray is just down a pawn against Sergei Movsesyan. So can he hold this? That's the question. I don't know about this end game. Well, yeah, the question is that there's a way to break through. Yeah, and I'm not... So maybe you just bring the king back to e4, play for e5, and just try to start by pushing that pawn. But it's not looking like a any way to make a clean victory here. And e5, finally played, takes, takes, move your bishop away. This looks like it's going to be a draw. I don't really see how black can make progress. Maybe play f4 at the right moment, but right now it's not happening. I don't know, I think I just tired myself out. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out, I'm looking at the same time at the standings, so guys, don't go anywhere because the standings are being updated constantly. So. The points are being added to the teams. We will see what is the final standings. Games are still underway. Nothing is completely finalized in what you see. So it's going to take a bit of a time still to add up all the points. And when we can f announce for sure which teams will make it to the playoffs, even though it's almost sure, and which teams will be relegated. Yep. So... I'm just, you know, taking a breather here because I got so excited during that final round. I felt like an auctioneer just going from game to game being like, and here we have this, and here we have that, and blah, 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 blah. like, who, $20, $20, 30 30 do I see 30 You know, just <laughs> got to get yeah. in that full quick-talking mode. Liam Chess is saying that 
chess bras are out that's finalized and well according to what we have calculated unfortunately yes and i see so many of you are fans of the chess bras understandably it's it's is a heartbreak especially knowing how badly they wanted to make it to the to the playoffs they started the pro chess league 27 2019 season so this year's season with three match victories they were one of the few teams that won all three matches after three weeks and then suddenly somehow there came the battle royales and they went down they went down in the first battle royale and ever since they weren't the same it's incredible but they were so close and yet they're not making it they're not making it to the finals or not even to the playoffs yeah very disappointing for sure and it's um you know you got to be upset for players like Ivan Sharic who have played so well throughout the season because you know it, it's tough especially when you had it in your own control and then you let it slip away and you know to this point in the season Ivan Sharic was performing well over 2700 and yeah. Eric Hansen struggled in some weeks played very well in others but I think a real problem for them is they didn't get enough Inish Giri. Giri played that one <laughs> battle royale went five and a half and yeah. a seven looked excellent you know, had fun playing against new competition, but unfortunately, not enough Geary, and so they ended up struggling down the stretch. And Michael Kleinman had a rough day throughout the Pro Chess League, I believe. So it's uh, it's tough. And it's over. All the games are over, so the score will be updated in a moment. All the points are being added up, and we're gonna see the final standings of the Atlantic Division. Look at this lineup, guys. All of you here, seven thousand two hundred and twelve. Lovely people, chess fans from all over the world. Have a look at this because you will not see four of those teams anymore for a couple of months, for the entire year. You will not see them again, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers, London Lions, good luck in requalification, right? There's a qualifier that happens, and that's actually a great event. Anna, you and I covered that one back in November. Um, yeah. But the qualification tournament is really tough, so it's not going to be easy for the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers and the London Lions to make their way back. These are the final standings. It's official. Greg is confirming that all of the scores have been added up and the match in the playoffs will be St. Louis versus Montclair and New York versus Webster. You know what I like about that, which the flip between the Marshalls and the windmills, it means that it's uh, Montclair against St. Louis. So instead of having Webster St. Louis, that like St. Louis area matchup and the New York yeah. area matchup. We now have a little bit of cross country challenge here where it's going to be the East Coast versus the Midwest in both matchups. And we'll see because the New York Marshals, now that they're in second place, they get draw odds against the windmills. And I know the Marshals take this incredibly seriously. They are uh, competing. I mean, I get emails from them because I'm a member of the Marshall Chess Club. So I get emails saying, please come to the Marshall Chess Club to support uh, you know, the competitors yeah. that are playing there. And they have great team camaraderie. They have great leadership. And it's been really, I've been really happy to see that because as someone who grew up in New York, seeing the, Mar uh, seeing the playing in the Marshall Chess Club, seeing the New York Marshalls thrive in the league is something that is good, not just for their team and for the local scene, but for just the chess world at large. It's great to see New York doing well uh, in an international stage. Yeah, I agree with you. And as pointed out, so we have those four teams that qualified, but St. Louis has the best odds. Every 8-8, eight, eight, every tied match at the beginning of the playoffs will mean, will mean that they move on. So in case of a tie, they have draw odds. And the New York Marshals also has that advantage over the Webster Windmills. Yep. And all the St. Louis Archbishops were the best team throughout the year. I think it's a very fair result to see them ahead. But we do, are going to have a special guest coming up pretty soon. We're going to bring up uh, Jamil John Ali Mirandi, who is known uh, to the streaming world for sure because the samurai, right? He's the samurai indeed. He's always and streaming. He is from the winning team. So the St. Louis Archbishop, shout out to the St. Louis Archbishop. They have won the regular season of the Atlantic Division. Next week we will start the playoffs, but they have this advantage as we already highlighted a couple of times that they can play 8-8 eight, eight in the knockout system and they will move on because of finishing first in the regular season. Yes, absolutely. So I think we are, I'm just gonna make sure that he's ready and actually I have a message from him waiting, but we're gonna have to take a short break just to figure out the tech so that we can bring him on. And let me just verify with 
everyone at chess.com and him that we're ready. Thank you so much for the chess bras for the raid. We are so sorry for the chess bra fans from all over the world that it was this close, but the chess bras are missing out on the qualification spot. We've been following the games closely and it started out well for the chess bras, but somehow the last two rounds were downhill. And unfortunately for the chess bras, it means that they will have to try again next year to make it to the playoffs of the Pro Chess League. All right. Get some of your chess brain modes in, in the chat while we will set up the interview. We'll be back in a minute with our special guest. Yep. See you very, very shortly. And we'll bring you JJ from the winning team. And we have our special guest here, Jamil John Ali Mirandi, a popular streamer here on Twitch and a very important member of the Atlantic Division winning St. Louis Archbishop. So first of all, JJ, congratulations. And how do you feel? Thank you, Robert. Um, I feel good that we won the division, honestly. Uh, it was kind of expected, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I was confident about the team. Uh, I could have played much better, obviously, but I'm glad we we managed to win. Hopefully, we do our best in the upcoming matches and qualify to the final four. Well, Anna, I played the St. Louis Archbishops to win the Atlantic Division, so I'm happy that, at least in this, I didn't fail the fantasy team. Well, uh, I think you good. You did the good choice. So, <laughs> Anna, I'm going to give you the first, uh, you know, uh, ladies first. I'm going to have to give you the first questions here because I have so many swirling through my mind. Anna, go ahead. Pepper JJ with all of the tough questions that you can think of. Well, I have one very important question, and that is regarding emotes, because I think you have one very nice emote on your channel, JJ. Many people know you as a streamer. And Robert created a similar emote on his channel with a different meaning. Have you seen his emote? I did. I did. I don't, I'm not a big fan of it, but I did. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Come on, JJ. We're friends. You got, you know, I, I support, know. I support your emote. You support mine. <laughs> even though they counter each other. Yeah. On a more serious note, how do yeah. you see the, the chances of the archbishops? You finish first. So that means that every tie break in the knockout system, every eight, eight match will favor your team. So you will move on. You have the draw odds. How do you see the chances? Then how likely is that we will see the same lineup? If you can reveal any information on the team dynamics of the archbishops? Well, to be honest, I don't know uh, about the lineups, so I can't reveal it myself since I don't know anything about them. But I think the event then which... it's then it's a secret. It's I think it's a big secret. <laughs> yes, the team <laughs> manager. The don't know about it. <laughs> the team manager will be picking the the correct lineup but i think the event is just starting to be honest for uh, the four teams um we got through most of it but it's by no means the end of the event so we have to keep on going and do our best uh winning it at the moment being first is of course good but it doesn't guarantee anything so we have to continue playing well and keep the wins going yeah, JJ, I have a question for you. You know, when you talk about keeping the wins going, what kind of pressure do you feel playing on a team with Fabiano Carwan and Wesley So? You kind of can rely on them to rack up victories, but you know, you don't want to disappoint them either and struggle and score under 50% either. So can you just tell everybody, do you feel extra pressure playing with them on your team? Certainly. I mean, Wesley, Fabi, they're both great players, but we can never uh fully alive. It would not be correct to fully rely because everyone can have bad days. Everyone can have excellent days. So it's just a good idea to keep doing your best. And even if you are doing not so well, try to keep the, the losses to a minimum and try to give them as much as uh, comfortable like situation as possible. Because I'm playing board three uh, in these lineups where I play and Seeing them score well obviously motivates me, but I still have to continue playing well just to support them. And together, I think it's working out so far. Can I ask if there's any team communication? Do you have any group on the social platform or a messaging group where you can talk to each other, the teammates? Well, not really. I mean, uh, we know each other quite well. It's just we don't really uh, keep in touch about it. but. Most of the Archbishop team members are my university teammates, so I see them very often. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't get to meet Wesley or Fabi uh, way too often, but I still know that they are 
doing their best and well i see them through zoom or i see <laughs> their game so i know they're fighting until the end so mm -hmm. happy to yeah happy to play and we all see wesley typing in game chats honestly so you won't even see this because yeah. you're playing your game but he actually goes if he's done with his game and looks in your game and like will comment and support the teammates so for example uh, josh bloomer made a draw against a much higher rated opponent and wesley was saying Wow, great job! You you know you played a good game and drew someone much higher. So it's really nice to see that element. But also, you said your teammates play from St. Louis University. Can you tell everybody where you're playing from right now? I'm currently at the St. Louis Chess Club. Uh, there was just an event finished here uh, on Sunday, and I just came here to play. And it's a very nice venue. It feels much better when you play in like a chess environment rather than a small cubicle in your room <laughs> so having that opportunity i try to play here as much as possible it's just a very wonderful chess chess club yeah for sure and i've been to your dorm at least I, your old dorm last year so i know that cubicle that you're talking about the club is certainly an upgrade and uh well are you going to be going to the club i know you know you're not playing for the u.s federation but there's a big event coming up next week at the u.s you know the u.s chess championship so are you going to be visiting that as well yeah absolutely i mean when there is any top player event or u.s championship even the classics i try to visit it as much as possible i do have school duties and stuff but i try to come here it's a big opportunity for me to see very strong players play over the board chess maybe spend time together in the evenings and just have a nice time here mentioning the club and that they are playing from the club uh, has it happened in previous weeks that it wasn't just you at the club and other players would also come to the club and you play from the same location or the others are playing from their homes? It hasn't happened because um, I haven't played for some weeks and hmm. so I didn't come to the club and whenever I play I think Fabi and Wesley play pretty much all the time and they have never visited the club so I don't think uh, players played at the same time in same location. I know that my roommates also in the team and there are two other roommates playing for the Archbishops, but we never had the chance to play all together at once. Mm. So it didn't happen. It might happen. We don't know. Um, but even though we're not in the same location, we're just doing our best for the optimum result. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I guess speaking of optimal result, you couldn't do any better than finishing in first place. But how do you feel about your matchup for the first round of the playoffs? Um, you know, it was very close between some of the teams there for second, third, and fourth. So playing the Montclair Sopranos, what's your experience with them like, and how do you feel about that matchup? I have not played against the Sopranos, but uh, I'm sure if I get a chance, I'll be doing my best. Uh, I like the format, but it doesn't mean that one, the strongest team uh, will win for sure. I like our chances, but we still have to do our best, as I said. Uh, we have the draw odds, uh, so it's, it's always favorable. But as I said, we cannot rely on uh, the top players making the points. We have to do our best each and every single board and try to get the minimum required to win the match. You have some questions from the chat as well, since you are known as a streamer. Yeah. So one question is from Benjamin. I'm sure you know him, BJH13. Yes. He's asking, how, how are you enjoying streaming on your own, that you are getting more and more active? Uh, I do enjoy streaming. I increase the number of uh, streams lately. I pretty much try to stream every single day, sometimes two times a day. Wow, uh, that's dedication. Yeah, I, after class, before class, and everything, I try to find time. Um, it's improving, really. I like to stream. I like the crowd. And if the viewers like it, I'll just keep it up. Awesome. I, I think we are all happy that you are so active on Twitch. And sometimes you would even stream twice a day before and after your classes. So you can discuss your preparation for university as well. And then how was the lecture? Well, the lectures are always, you know, ups and downs. So. <laughs> <laughs> you don't discuss that on your Twitch channel. <laughs> no, no, not really. Well, actually, I mean, I, I think part of the great thing 
one of the great things about Twitch is getting to know the people who are good in the field. So um, what do you, I mean, I'm sure people who go to your chat know, but there are many new faces here. Uh, can you tell people, in addition to being a very strong chess player and grandmaster, what is it that you're studying at St. Louis, St. Louis University? Yeah, I'm a junior, double majoring in computer engineering and computer science. Uh, a lot of techn technology and stuff like that. So I like computers and playing around with them is always fun. So I chose a field like that. And I, the logical question, or I don't know logical, but what everyone follows up with is, how do you feel that your chess you know, history and experience has helped you academically? Well, it, it helps me to be more uh, planned and prepared, to be honest. That's why I can actually stream twice a day, because if I didn't have everything sorted out, I would be, if I was all around the place, I could not uh, keep up the schedule. So once I know that I am actually available, I try to spend most of my free time doing something useful rather than wasting it. And by useful, I generally pick uh, streaming unless I have to do something else. So I'm more organized. I'm much better in terms of like logical concepts in school, uh, which apply to most of computer algorithms and whatnot. So, yeah, it helps in many fields. Yeah. Mentioning computer and engineering, how do you see the latest games that have been released and the book on AlphaZero? If you are you impressed with artificial intelligence in chess, or is that something that's interesting to you? Oh yeah, I mean uh, AlphaZero. And it's just amazing. I, I can't like hide my uh, like emotions sometimes that it's playing so great that uh, I just don't know how it's possible. But I mean, artificial intelligence is improving every single day. I am also interested uh, in this topic. Um, so it's great to see such engines like that. But uh, it also makes me worried sometimes how good the engines can play. Yeah, and I have a question for you. It's going to be a little bit out of left field, but I've been just been informed that you're playing a match against Danny Wrench, and it's going to be a French. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> a French versus an anti-French matchup. So tell us your thoughts with that upcoming match and how badly you're going to destroy Danny and show everybody, including me, that the French is for real. Uh, yeah, it's it will be on the 24th of March, and I'm very excited to see that because as a French player, I was always in the chat seeing all this hate and also positive, uh, positive Thank you, comments. Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> and I took it to the heart, and I'm like, we have to arrange something because uh, this is not how French opening should be treated. <laughs> That's where the emote came from. That's. Uh, and then the idea, of course, popped up to my mind. Let me first challenge Danny, and if I can overtake him, maybe I'll challenge other players, you know? <laughs> so. Thank you so much for being on duty to take down all the French haters in our chess.com community. Well, it might backfire. That's the problem, you know? If I lose <laughs> the match, then it's going to be like French is disgusting <laughs> and no one's going to ever play it. Um, but I will always be supporting the idea of playing the French. The only thing I don't want Danny to play is taking on D5. I think. <laughs> oh, then we it will should, tell him he's a coward if he's going to do that. It should be critically written that he takes D5 is going to <laughs> lead to some sort of a ban on <laughs> something. Well, what's the time control? I got to know that. Uh, I'm not sure, but we don't want the flagging to be a part of it. I personally want the opening to play rather than our mouse speed. Okay. Uh, because if we make it like one plus zero, even if white is winning in the opening and then I flag him, it's not going to be anything or the other way around. No, I love how you threw the other way around because I, I am, you know, Danny, I love you. I know you're probably watching this, but if I had to put a bet, even though I can't stand the French, if there's one adamant French defender putting his reputation on the line, and that's you in this case, I'm going to have to put my money on you. Sorry, Danny. I, I, I went against our anti-Frenchness, but... Um, yeah, you know, if it's a sp any kind of speed chess game, um, you got my uh, backing here. So, I think it would make sense to have like five plus two or three plus two, something with an increment, so no flagging will be uh, involved. But still, it's going to be a fast time. Game, so. All right. Well, we're going to be excited to see that. I think right now we're going to throw it over to Levy Rosman and Alexander Botez because 
they are ready to cover the Pacific Division, the Battle Royale, to decide who makes the playoffs from there. But JJ, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. JJ's, Thanks, JJ's Twitch streamer, um, Twitch stream is right on, on hit over him, over his face, underneath me. So please give him a follow, and you can also follow myself and the one and only Anna Rudolph. Anna, any final words for the Atlantic Division for 2019? Oh, I just wanted to thank JJ for crushing Danny in my name as well. Like all the French lovers in the world will be so thankful to you. So I want to thank you in advance. And the Pacific Division is going to be very exciting. Still, the qualifications spots and which team will be relegated, it's, it's still unclear. So stay with us. It's going to be Gotham Chess, Levy Roseman and Alexandra Botas taking over for the broadcast. JJ, thank you so much for coming over for the interview and good luck for the match. Thank you very much for having me, and I'll just go back to my room and follow the rest of the game. <laughs> well, we'll definitely talk to you later. Thank so you. thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank Stay you. put. Do not leave. Levy and Alexandra coming up right now.